tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Professor Sawyer sat across from me, seemingly astounded by my offer. Placing his wine gently back upon the table, he wiped his mouth with my good linen and stared across my long walnut dark stained table into my unwavering gaze. Ow! Oh, please, <laughs> forgive me, Lord Langdale. It sounded like you said... Yes, I purposely interrupted. Well... I'm meant to be home very soon. I must have certainly overstayed my welcome, he meekly added, placing the linen down onto his half-eaten plate of food. You were saying something, Professor, I interrupted. Well, it just sounds quite bizarre, if I'm being honest, sir, he half-heartedly pleaded. Look good, sir. I have been quite charitable to your institutions, have I not? I've advocated on your behalf numerous times to bankers for the land that your group currently reside on, have I not? I have even presented myself as an adjunct professor within numerous sessions at the university as a favor to you in an effort to instruct your students on the finer points of negotiating commercial contracts, a role that the London facilities often pay me quite handsomely for. A hefty fifty pounds per day, on occasion, and here. I was being a servant to you, a friend, someone that had, has, influence in this country, and has ensured that you were well taken care of, almost as soon as you and your lovely Catherine had arrived from Suffolk. Nearly one year ago, I explained. I tilted my head slightly as to beg his sense and to ensure that I had made my point as clearly as possible. Surely, what I have asked of you is not out of order or nonsensical. Certainly quite possible. No? I added. Professor Sawyer stood, fixed his specs, and looked down and around the table, searching his mind for any appropriate response. Sir, are you not aware of... The, it's madness! Excuse me, sir. You forget yourself. I lambasted. Poor choice of words. M my apologies. What I mean is that what you've asked me, what you've instructed me to do, and with what seems like little consideration, it seems, for the abhorrent nature of your request, is just impossible. Professor, what I have asked of you is not impossible. It is not technically unethical. Unorthodox, yes. Fine, but you have the capacity within you, within your role as headmaster of University of Manchester, to provide me with only a few cadavers from your science laboratories. These are rotting kilos of meat that you play with. Teach with, sir. They are a means of education and donations from the National Anatomical Donation Program. Whatever semantics you choose to operate under, they are still dead things. They are provisioned to you regularly. Why should you lose sleep over the expediting of two or three to me? I implied with plain sense. For what, Lord Langdale? To what end? For what purpose? Why would... Any private man need a dead body, the professor erupted. This, uh, this is something I can't divulge. You need to understand. I fund various organizations, and those many groups operate their own scientific research. And in order to complete their work, they require certain uh, things, components, that will further their work. Trust me, this work is all for mankind. This is not for me to decide for them. I'm happy to share the results with you once finalized, and I will. Yes, yes, here is what I'll do. I will promise to you that you will receive the first option for peer review and study and dissemination of the white papers to your university shareholders. 
You will be a hero to the board and your faculty. What a tremendous opportunity. No, sir, no. I cannot do this. There are protocols in place. These cadavers are heavily secured. Their families have given exclusive rights to the university, and if any were to go missing, it would be devastating for all involved. I just can't. I hope that you understand. Perhaps you can convince a, a cemetery keeper with a couple shillings to dig up something, but I'll have no part of this. The professor exclaimed without any other thought or idea to recommend. I glared at Sawyer. This was insulting enough to move him towards the unexpected phase two quickly. Cemetery keeper. How dare he! This impudent troll. Ah, professor. If you feel that you are not able to accommodate my ask, then I shall have no further need for encouraging funding to the university since, well, it has no support for me and my work. All influence shall cease for the university and, in fact, well, I will do my best to keep my mouth closed after a few brandies with some of your association's benefactors. Perhaps they may, God forbid, no longer see you as a competent headmaster. Goodness, no. What am I saying? Absolutely fiendish I am. I finished with a mischievous snigger. But, sir... This is not right, he replied. Well, Mr. Uh, uh, Professor Sawyer, I shall see you out, shall I? Or you know the way. I gestured forward, fingers presenting the main hall direction. Tut, tut, well, my stomach is urging me to... to attend the toilet immediately. Goodbye, sir. I gave a slight nudge to the small of his back. My tall, gaunt, and somewhat skeletal servant, Crookshank, appeared from the hall. This way, sir, he said in a booming voice, with a glance to me, while I provided a knowing nod back to him. Farewell, Professor, and enjoy your cadavers. I finally waved cheekily with a smile, and turned back towards the smoking room with my cabernet and pipe. The professor stood staring at me, stunned at the speed in which he was dispatched from my home. Unceremoniously, yes, but I no longer needed him, nor was he well behaved, if I'm being honest. He was guided through the door, into the rain, by Crookshank, and doors shut within centimeters of him as he departed. Oh, and Crookshank, have Tubbs and Arthur make it clean and covert. Yes, sir, he replied. A shame. He was a nice fellow, I whispered to myself as I took a seat. A man's terrified scream and the sound of a fleshy thud soon followed from outside in the distance. Listening intently, curled into my leather armchair, I took a wisp of pipe and then shouted a dictation to my butler. Crookshank, please send a message to his widow. Uh, sorry, his wife. Dear Madam Sawyer, I'm rather upset that the dear professor could not show the commonplace courtesy of a message if he were not going to show up to a dinner I had so specially crafted for his pleasure when asked. I would have expected a man of his carriage to have made his unfortunate absence a thing of knowing for the gracious host. I requested. Yes, sir, of course, said my lanky accomplice. Oh, and tell our lads that when I demand it to be quiet, I expect it quiet, or they will be on the receiving end of the pickaxe on the next occasion. Oh, sir... Will you be expecting me to lock you in this evening? Offered Crookshank. Yes, please do so, Edward. And then, bring him to me. I said. I won't be able to stomach it until then. Very good, my lord. Offered the very obedient Edward Crookshank. As you wish. 
I am Lord Langdale, if you haven't speculated yet. My family has left me with massive tracts of land across the north of England. Therefore, I have developed some level of influence. Any farmer, factory owner, or educational or financial institute that operates on my land pays me tax. No, not federal tax. They pay me a bit of a divvy outside the Queen's demands. This is my land. My domain. My kingdom. Our family have been deed bearers of this land for over two centuries. The land is not the only thing that we have in common. A secret. Well, I suppose it is a secret in as much as we have never accounted for it in public. We have never offered up the truth, and this makes it scuttlebutt. Or, let's say, inadmissible evidence. As the barrister that I ate last night would have properly termed it. My great-grandfather was Aldrich Langdale. He passed this secret on to my grandfather, Ellery Langdale, to my mother Mary Langdale, and then to me, Neville Langdale. We are a large group, our family. A bit of a widespread pack. So widespread were we at one time that we had agreed many decades ago that we would disperse globally. Dozens of our family boarding ships for every part of the world. It was a bit too concentrated here for what we were. I expect my subjects to ensure my quality of life. I don't ever expect to work or engage in the trifles of business dealings, let alone the indignity of manual labor of any sort. So, they can whisper. Engage in talk of ghoulish fiends roaming the countryside for blood, and that's acceptable for me. This palpable fear continues to provide me with what I want. When they resist or become too fatiguing, well, you would do well to remember Professor Sawyer. He was an unfortunate case, yet a cautionary tale. I could have easily allowed him to walk away, home to his lovely wife, but this night I was particularly hungry, and not in the most tolerant spirit. I knew that if I didn't have something this evening, particularly fresh for my nightly meal, especially in my peckish state, I would have to make a decision to roam. When I roam, it is never pleasant. Much hysteria. Painfully frustrating screams, but mostly it's risky for me. The less I am witnessed in my more alpha form, the better for me and my family. Most of my family here have passed away. My granddad could barely chew through a femur before he left us last year. My dear mother lives alone on a skip of land I had provided for her on the edge of my estate. She ate my father many years before. Reckless bit of business marrying a lichen to be fair. He took his chances. I feel reckless myself at times. I don't want Crookshank to lock me up during these bright evenings. I want to feel the freedom to run through the forests of this beautiful countryside and hunt the breeze, the cold against my luscious fur, the sounds of hearts beating, really, to hunt like I was created to do. I often feel impotent and weak when caged, like a pet. They really should thank me, however. I subject myself to this indignity to protect their way of life. Sometimes, I think I should consider my own desires over the petty lies of these odious peasants. No more than living, breathing kebabs. Crookshank had locked my holding cage, a nine square meter iron box that was approximately five meters high. When he finished, I nodded to him in recognition that he had done what I had asked him as we both simultaneously understand that this is required, but never a pleasant situation. If I were to meander freely, even my poor Edward, the maids, the cook, and the gardening lads that do my real bloody work would not be safe. There is no sense from a humanity perspective when I am lichen, when I am powerful and extricated from the bonds of sympathy and emotion. 
Now, it is important to understand that when the moon is in its fullest phase, I feel a madness that is even more profound than usual. But it is important to keep in mind that each night, regardless of the moon's exposure from the sun's illumination, I change. The fuller moon presents a gravity that pulls at your brain fluids or something like that. I once heard this explained during a lecture from a very talented academic specializing in astronomy and such. He was very entertaining. And for this, I would have never dared to consume him. I tend to read with a small candle sat outside my cage while I wait for the unbearably painful transformation. Isn't that odd? Reading as a man of eloquence and rational thought prior to abruptly becoming something of nightmares. I once heard this story of a man in London named Dr. Henry Jekyll was convicted of terrible crimes under some alias. He developed a condition that allowed him to capitulate to his more barbaric temperaments. Well, he certainly didn't come by his infliction as honestly as I had. I feel the pressure mounting in my chest and my legs and then my head. A terrible headache forms and that's when I know it's near. A sharp ache in my legs as if they were being pulled apart on a torture device. My arms next. My chest, though. I feel my ribs fracturing. Hard to continue to illustrate these symptoms, but I will continue to try while my sanity remains even in its most vague state. Hair rapidly sprouts up across my arms and across my body. My clothes begin to tear and throughout, the pain encapsulates my entire body. It becomes unbearable. Swiftly, assisting the madness to overcome me. My screams fill the cellar, echoing throughout the mansion. What must they think of me upstairs? When this happens, fear or only inconvenience? My butler, my maids and other servants that have been entrusted to my secret and have kept it as caged as my physical presence for fear of their swift punishment from fangs and claws. My head begins to crack. I can hear it inside. The pain gushes through my brain as my skull takes new form, pulls my face apart. I can not think. I only feel pain, a pain that is as common for me as breath. It never fully not make sense. I have grown larger, much larger, too large for this cage, yet trapped nonetheless. Powerful arms covered in deep black fur. Eyes now see throughout the pitch dark of my containment space. Watching rats scurry, I feel their heartbeats. I want meat. I crave blood and flesh. I crave living blood to rip apart. I need this. I need this. I see the corpse of Professor Sawyer, mostly intact, and I rip into its chest with my snout deeply embedded into his intestines. Tearing apart chunks of flesh with tapered razor-sharp fangs, gulping down blood and flesh in my most savage condition. I cannot get enough. Crunching down on the skull from this now mess of gore, devouring bone and cartilage, now lapping at the pool of blood left until my rusted metal cage is empty of nothing more than dried spots of liquids. I exhale and then howl. I howl for both satisfaction and, conversely, hunger for more. This has merely whetted my appetite. I chew at the bars of the cage like a mindless beast, chewing upon the teeth marks left from every evening. This was the ritual that I engaged in after each feeding. I always wanted more. Eventually, after more howling, I slept. Awaking in filth and sickness. As usual, is Lord Langdale.
Like clockwork, Edward stands ready with cage opened and breakfast prepared upstairs. He wipes me down with a hot, wet cloth and assists me up the stairs. The pain is not yet left and the capacity for walking unattended has not yet returned to me. I sit, alone, in my massive dining room and eat porridge, fish, eggs and bacon and sip my tea. Maria, my cook, always prepares extra as the first serving never stays long in my stomach. Then, after breakfast, I bathe, get dressed and make my way to the town to collect what is mine. My security man, Gordon, accompanies me. He is a human beast of a man, nearly 200 centimeters in height and barrel-chested, nearly seven stone, and a face that would make any normal man empty his bowels upon fiery glance. There are times when some of the merchants feel the need to instantly oppose my requests, and sometimes with tools. Gordon, then, would easily wrench the tools from their hands and nearly crush their throat while they're lifted by the necks off the ground. Then it doesn't happen again. Gordon really is the reason why I collect easily. The stories of bogeymen are really a side thing for the more supernatural of the county occupants. Would you like to hear something interesting? My alternate form really does dwarf Gordon. And when Gordon first saw me in this state, he quickly shat his pants and ran. <laughs> if I were not caged, of course, not thinking as myself, I perhaps would have felt this a bit of fun and decimated him in seconds. I do love a good chase. We continued our stroll throughout the town square, and then a carriage ride to the outer reaches of the village, to the farms and small factories. They were waiting for us and most putting on brave faces to provide me with food and, of course, my wages. I preferred coin over meat and vegetables. Meat I could come by quite easily especially the type of meat that they do not distribute or sell. I arrived at the farm of Thomas Kennedy, an Irishman migrated years ago to my part of Old Blighty. A hard-working, ginger-haired, scrappy man of about sixty, still muscular and tough. Kennedy often spoke little, and when educated about the way that commerce operates here in my country, he gave when he had to but never without a look of repulsion and contempt. As long as he provided me with what I wanted, I don't care if he bawled and rolled about the dirt like a child. He gave and he gave on time, and that's all I cared about. He poured the coins into Gordon's giant palm from a small leather satchel. Then I had noticed behind him a man, an apparent farmhand, how did I miss this behemoth? A giant, also ginger-headed, bearded, but a face of youth behind the beard. His eyes. Something about his eyes. They were silver blue. I'd never seen anything like him before. Immediately, I wondered to myself if he would be tough to eat or bland due to his size. The smaller scallops and strawberries are always the most delicious. Isn't that the common suggestion? I have found that older people are terrible to eat. To spare you my more gruesome details, I won't continue in this line of thought. My sister's boy. The plague took her in Galway and I took him in over here. He helps me with the livestock and the general farming. He's a strapping boy. Quite capable. Thomas Kennedy told me. I should say so. My word, the boy is a beast, I replied. I motioned for this large young man to come forward. Farm boy, come here. I should like to speak with you. Kennedy motioned to him that it was okay and the farmhand motioned back. He walked towards me. He was different, easily ten centimeters taller than Gordon and more muscular. I should very much want this man to work for me, perhaps alongside Gordon as a protege. Gordon was getting quite advanced in age himself and would need someone to mentor, but there was something even more sinister about this farmhand. 
if you can believe it. Youthful face, bright eyes, an obvious attachment to kindness in his features, but he was trouble. I felt it. He had a strange scent. This was coming into realization as he moved towards me. I stopped him midway. Wait. No, no, sir. On second thought, you may continue your work. I am a busy man and I must take my leave. I said, something off-putting about this young man. I gestured to Gordon to finish up the collection of some vegetables, along with the depositing of coins into our coffer, and we were off to the local tavern for a quick bite to eat. The rabbit was excellent, as were the pints of bitter ale. On the house, as you can imagine. I've heard whispers across the pub, in conversation, about missing townsfolk. I had ascertained from the miscellaneous chatter that at least four were gone missing. This was quite unusual, because nobody leaves or dies without notification to a family or neighbor, and secondly, I was not out prowling. Well, not my concern, nor did I care. As we journeyed back to Langdale Estate in my carriage, I could not stop thinking about this strange young man. I rarely felt disconcerted, light apprehension to a human before. He seemed to have sensed it also. I felt something in his eyes that seemed to resonate with a sense of anger or loathing towards me. Not a squint or peering of his eyes, just the pupils of his eyes and the flush of his face gave me a feeling of danger from him. It's very bizarre. Someone exhilarating, if I'm being honest. Then again, he was the largest being I had encountered, next to Gordon, and being a stranger, he piqued my interest, but hardly interested me after some time. Professor Sawyer was quickly replaced with one of his subordinates at the university. His wife continued to grieve, and his children were inconsolable. If I were not such a ghoul, utterly lacking of empathy, I would feel terrible for having deleted him from their lives. But I have more important things to attend to. I needed access to the anatomical locker of the university. They had dozens of regularly supplied corpses. This would be so much easier than having to truly work for it. I would invite the replacement headmaster to dinner, perhaps next month. Time to eliminate suspicion, of course. Either we make a deal or he becomes my meal. I had some of the ladies come by for a bit of much-needed exertion after dinner. Then I spent the evening with my pipe and my book in the study. The fire was crackling, and the book was very good. Then, as the first pangs hit my stomach, I knew that I needed to get into the cellar. I took a long swig of whiskey to numb the pain. Then had Edward ensure the lock was in place. He had more to gain from my security in the cage than I. I was beginning the evening's transformation, when just before my bones began to crack and the pain took over my mental state, came a howl close by. This was absolutely not a wolf's howl. Many would interpret this as such, but I knew better. This was another like me. I had not heard this in many years, since my mother stopped changing from the old age. There were no others like me in this vicinity. This was not a familiar. I know the howls of all of my family. They were like fingerprints. This was unfamiliar to me. A stranger. I was seconds away from losing my current consciousness before beginning a new one, so rational thought and assessment of my wolf and peer was fleeting. I heard one more howl, a fierce one filled with rage. Then I was gone. The new me was here now, inhabiting my mind, and now this new incarnation of me would not be considering the options. Only smelling, listening, and now stuck in this cage, helpless to investigate. 
a night of savage madness, biting, chewing on this cage for release, a release to hunt down this intruder. Like in me did not have to wait long. This new thing was not only closer now, its howls were replaced by growls. Then, as I gazed towards the moonlit exterior of my home, the courtyard view from the window of my cellar, a pair of glowing eyes, I went mad, roaring at the beast that had invaded my space. It remained far calmer and more collected, just baring its teeth at me. I, at it, was my enemy. Its coat was lighter than mine. Brown fur. Red-tinged. This thing was new. It rolled its tongue across its fangs. I was stuck in this cage. I could not attack. I barked, yelped, howled. When Edward opened the cellar door to ensure that I was okay, alarmed at the unusual and erratic activity coming from me, in my cage, it, the hairy visitor, disappeared from the window. Edward stared at me, as terrified as he had always been of me in this massive, terrible form. I was uncontrollable. He disappeared upstairs to fetch me a raw rib cage of cow. If I were in my alternate sane state, I would have wondered how he would have expected to feed me. With the cage locked and unlocked, he'd be in trouble. I soon came to understand that this was no longer an issue, since after the door had smashed open upstairs, various screams from across my home. Pure terror. In the voices of my staff was enough to excite the beast enveloping me and anger me simultaneously. I tore at the cage. I ripped at the lock, wrapped my enormous claws around the bars, and shook with a pent-up fury that I had not felt before. I would tear myself apart to get out of this, to deal with this intruder with no mercy, or be destroyed trying. It was no use. I did not fatigue easily in this state, but the constant burst of energy, rattling and biting at these bars tired me, and as I lay, breathing, panting, listening to my surroundings, I recognize that the screams had ceased. I can only assume that my demon intruder had ended them all. All of my staff, those closest to me. I stood in my cage, claws closing into a fist and opening and closing. I listened as the heavy footsteps slowly made their way to the top of the cellar stairs, where my now deceased Cookshank had left the door opened. My chest heaved with angry breaths and low, involuntary rumbling gnarls. Then, slow, heavy steps descended down into my cellar, into my view. The dark hid nearly all except the silhouette of something huge. Eyes glowing, it stood and surveyed me. I squinted with my bright red eyes to see it better. My position inside of the moonlight through the window provided my foe a better vantage. It was far larger than I in any state. It moved forward in the moonlight. Its fur was reddish-brown, of course, matted with wet blood in parts. Long hair compared to my black, short, rough fur. I growled at it, bared my teeth. It did the same. It walked closer, and its wolf and snout sniffed at me, and then extended its bloodied face and chest forward, arms stretched back, 
and roared an ungodly roar. I sent my claws to my ears to cover them. I had never heard a sound so loud. Suddenly, in the distance, town bells ringing. I could hear, even with my now damaged ears, the screaming of villagers in the distance. The bells continued and this ginger beast made one final glare at me. As I did him, and it raced off up the stairs and out of the house into the distance. I must say, if I were not protected by this cage, the mere size and fury of this thing convinced me that I would be no match and reduced to a pile of fur and flesh upon my cellar floor. I had never felt the sensation of being prey in my entire existence. Up until now, was the predator. Now prey stuck in a cage until I return to human form. In the instance where I should need freeing from this enclosure, Edward and I had agreed that the keys would be easily reachable, with human arms, on a hook on the wall nearby, unreachable with my mammoth-lichen arms. Even in that condition where I could never use sense enough to unlock a lock, I had done so, and released myself the following morning, with little memory of what happened. I knew a tragedy had occurred, and that my staff were gone, and that there was another, like me. A strange thing. My terrible condition. I have no faculties, no capacity for rational thought, yet I remember, much like a drunk may do the following morning, fleeting elements of past occurrences. This was enough for me to know what had happened. Even sparks of images, visuals of the beast that were difficult to forget in any capacity. My staff were indeed gone. I confirmed this with a cursory survey of my mansion in the following morning. Hannah and Anna, my maids. Maria, my cook. Tubbs and Arthur, my gardeners. And my dear Edward and my giant Gordon all torn to pieces. Edward in the pantry and the rest in their bedrooms. I sincerely feel that they may have assumed that it was me loose in the house and that I would appeal to my inner reason and not harm them. Otherwise, they would have tried to flee, I'm sure. I cleaned up the mess, stored the bodies in the cellar. Yes, there was no better way to dispose of them as brutish as it seems. My horses were also dead torn apart in the stables. I cleaned myself up and walked into town. It was easily an hour walk through the wooded pass. My estate was a 15-minute carriage ride to the village. It ran through a heavily wooded area. I had often thought of erecting a fence around my property so that I may be loose in the evening, so that I may hunt deer and other creatures without attacking the village. This consideration was laid to rest when I realized that no fence would hold me in if I truly felt a desire to wander further. It was approximately 10 a.m. when I reached the town, wary from the walk. I knew that I could easily pay one of these handsome cabs, horse-drawn carriages for hire, for my journey back. I immediately arrived at the castle hotel and tucked into a large breakfast with a pint of black. I had asked around for new hires. I needed to find replacements for my staff. This would be a rigorous task, as these servants would need to be made aware in fear of their absolute secrecy. My staff had been with me for over twenty years, and now they were gone. All of them. I'm not sure how I would go about acquiring new house help at this time, when the stories of my beastly existence had gathered steam over these last two decades. I immediately thought of the farmhand at the Kennedy place. I paid my meal and rushed out to a hired carriage, paid them a day's wage for their service, and had them take me directly out to the farm. I had to have this boy for my staff. He would need to replace Gordon. I would pay him handsomely, and he would need not lift the bale of hay again. Of course, I would compensate his uncle with adequate concessions and he would come and stay with me. 
he would be made to understand the situation. I would sit him down, and under the penalty of fear and riches, he would eventually come to understand what I require from him. My bodyguard throughout my collection's activity in public, and to assist me at home. I could easily lock myself in. Edward had crafted the lichen-proof plan of having the keys close by. Inaccessible to anything other than human arms, so I could easily lock myself in, nightly, and release myself in the morning. It would be helpful to have a new improved staff join immediately, and I had pegged this man as my first permanent hire. My carriage pulled up into the mud of the Kennedy's farm road, in front of their modest cabin. Instantly, Thomas, not recognizing the carriage, shouted that he wanted no bankers or collection agents on his property. I shouted back that it was just me, to his surprise. He walked carefully towards me. He seemed exceptionally watchful of me, distrustful of my presence, seemingly, in his eyes. He asked how he may be of service. Thomas, my good man, where is the lad we met yesterday? Your nephew? I asked. What do you want of him? He beckoned back, guardedly. He seemed to not be curious as to the whereabouts of my driver and of Gordon, who had accompanied me to his homestead weekly, for as long as Kennedy became a serf on my land. Good lord, man! I need only have a word with him about a rare opportunity. I replied. Thomas eyed me and turned towards the house, and shouted. Lamb, get your arse out here! Beyond Thomas's shoulder, I saw the big man exit the cottage, head lowering to pass through the frame of the door. There's a good lad, I whispered to myself, admiring the size and potential of the giant. Dear Mr. Kennedy, may we speak privately? I mean, your nephew and I. I requested. I would prefer that I'm present for the young lad's business. I'm responsible for his care as custodian, and he being in my charge in place of my dear deceased sister, his mother. He responded, thoughtfully. I'm sure this was not an issue. May I step inside, if you'd be so kind? I asked. With slight hesitation, he gestured for me to come inside. We sat at his small, humble table that seemed handmade. He offered me tea. I declined and assured them both that I would be straight to the subject, without delay. I would need to be attending my hired carriage and home before dark. They were relieved by this, it appeared. Well, let me preface this by thanking you for taking this time to listen to my proposal. My man Gordon, the large ape-like gentleman that so often accompanies me during my visits, he's fallen ill and had to return to Glasgow. Of course, I accepted this as my care for my employees is of my utmost priority. I digress. I am in need of an assistant, let's say. One of the right size stature, somewhat of an imposing figure, most succinctly, if I may. Someone like you, young Liam. I point my finger towards the lad, and I focus my attention towards him, even as we were all sat, was a solid quarter meter above me. He seemed confused. Thomas, his uncle, immediately protested. No, I'll have none of it. He's needed here with me. He's my primary help during farming season. I need to look after him. Nope, he stays in my employ and under my care, as he has for all this time. Thomas Kennedy made his case. The giant lad continued to peer from face to face during the debate with no bias towards either expectation. Thomas, Thomas, just hold a minute, sir. I respect and understand your plight. I respect and understand your situation, the caring for the boy and the need for assistance on your property. Here is what I propose, and just hear me out, please. I continued. I will release you from any debt or serfdom payments to me in perpetuity. I will also pay 200 shillings for his service for one year. This is easily enough to acquire two or three hands to assist with the remaining of the farming season, which, I might add, will end in less than a month, 
which leaves you with a tidy profit. And, of course, no need to shelter or feed him. And you and I both know, he requires a substantial budget for meals, I'm sure. I chuckled. So, I finished, Liam would stay with me in exceptional accommodation, up at the house, accompany me weekly, and help me with odd jobs during the day. He could visit you as often as he likes, of course. I accepted this as a fabrication. I could not allow Liam to associate with his uncle once he is made aware of my secret. Thomas looked at Liam and ensured that he was okay with this agreement. Liam seemed happy to not care one way or the other, and upon leaving... I sensed a smile on his lips, happy to be ridding himself of manual labor and peasant living. We boarded the carriage after he took care of packing up his meager belongings and said goodbye to his uncle. We would have a very uncomfortable conversation shortly. The sooner the better. The sky was getting dim and we had a 45-minute journey yet to return to Langdale Manor. It would be a rapid education for young Liam. As we rode up the muddy road, my eye caught something ahead that contrasted with the dark wetness of the mud. I asked the driver to stop, out of curiosity. It was not more than 200 meters from the boy's home. I peered at the side of the carriage. Liam tried to look but could not see from his vantage point, especially with his head craned downwards due to his height. I peered closely, and it seemed to be... No, it was a large pile of vomit. My heart stopped as I noticed within this large pile of sick a hand, a man's hand with a ring. This ring was very recognizable to me. This was the hand of Edward. The ring was a brass one, gifted to him by his late wife. My eyes had viewed this ring thousands of times over the past 20 years or so. This was Edward's hand, along with other bodily pieces too gnarled and half-digested to identify. Near it, footsteps on one side of a massive beast, much like my other self, trailing away in the direction of the Kennedy farm, were the footsteps of a man, barefoot man. My heart sunk. It was clear to me now, in an instant. Everything in one gleaning. The beast that visited last night and took the lives of my staff, destroyed my home, my horses, and was now a threat to my existence, it was ginger, and more massive than I could have imagined. Much like this boy. This beast. This was the very soul that was sat next to me in this carriage. He was unaware of my knowledge of this currently. All of my plans changed in that instant. My new hire, my new hope for a right hand, was now my enemy. A thing that must be dealt with. He would need to be destroyed before dark, of course. One thing now tugged at my mind. His mother had died. I think that I know how, after all. Carry on, driver! The carriage driver whipped the horses and we carried on. To home. Where my vengeance and punishment await. Oh, my mood was dark now, and it was difficult to conceal. I did my best to appear cheerier and feign happy conversation. Luckily, Liam was not a talker. He barely uttered more than a few words in his thick Irish brogue. We arrived at the manor. We dismounted as I asked the driver to bring the bags into the foyer. Liam stood outside, staring at the house. He was astounded at its size. He seemed somewhat happy to now be residing in a mansion. I whispered to myself between grinding teeth, with seething rage, You should not seem so happy. You bastard. You should be afraid. Why was he not connecting his nocturnal activities to this place? Why was he not remembering this location as an obvious recollection? He should be repelled from it rather than smiling. 
Does he not have the ability to remember as I do? Too young? Too dark last evening? No matter. He will no longer be of any further thought soon. Then I would need to deal with his uncle. He would be snooping for his nephew soon enough. He would be trouble. The two would need to be removed. First, though, with pleasure, this beast. Then I shall think on him no more, and I shall never again fear his visits in the night. Easy enough. We walked into the house. I, of course, showed him around to the kitchen, pantry, parlor, my smoking room, the atrium in the back, as I felt no need to show him the upstairs. We walked towards the tool shed. I told him that I wanted him to see where we kept the tools. In a muddled and half-intelligent manner, he asked where the staff were. I was now certain of something that was kept from me. This boy was not mentally acute. He was feeble-minded. This is why he spoke so little, and was used as an ox at the Kennedy farm. Well, in the evening, he was a murderous ghoul. That is why he must be disposed of. I walked him into the tool structure in the back of the property. I knew the driver had left, paid, and now he was off the property. As we peered around, I allowed him to look around. This is when I took the shears from the wall. And as he looked more closely at the plow, I drove the pointed end of the shears into his back as hard and deeply as I could muster. He howled in shock and pain. He obviously had no breath in him due to the predicament. Blood gushed from him. I dared not look him in the eyes. I had felt some sadness, after all, about this, but I was certain that he was my foe. He had this coming for murdering my staff, my horses, and showing up at my home as a menace. He may not have deserved this as a young lad, but he certainly would deserve this for his beast persona. I twisted it to make the death as quick as possible. He slumped to the ground. Blood drenched the dirt floor from his mouth and his wound. This mountain of a man would be nearly impossible for me to shift from here. I would need to reduce him to pieces. Not the work that I typically engage in, but as it was getting dark, I needed to get below. And I'd deal with this mess tomorrow. I locked the shed door. Leaving this body made me both satisfied and somewhat melancholy. It was not the first time that I had taken life, but most certainly my first in human form. And I did not enjoy it, I will tell you. I knew he had to be removed, but he was just a dim giant of a lad that was innocent enough in his human form, obviously. I would take the beef ribs that Edward had prepared for me in the evening into the cage with me and lock myself in. I lit a half dozen candles in the cellar for a bit of light, now that I was alone and somewhat not as comfortable in the dark as I was the prior evenings. I entered my enclosure feeling somewhat helpless, knowing that for the very first time I was alone. No Edward, Gordon, or the ladies to assist me if I needed. Then there was nothing more to worry about. I locked the large iron padlock and placed the key arm's length on the wall, barely able to get my human arm between that part of the enclosure, but just enough. I would change, hopefully sleep, and start the new day with the rest of my new hires to be acquired. No more danger from our ginger-haired monstrosity now that he has been dealt with, alone in my vast mansion, in a cage. A strange world this has become. After an hour or so of laying in my cage, contemplating my tasks ahead, I began my transformation. I could see my own shadow by candlelight, and it was disturbing to watch my legs elongate it in shadow on the wall while I screamed and writhed in pain. The cracking of bone and tearing of sinew as I eventually stood. The Alpha. Once again, the most terrible creature of this land, ripping into my dinner, 
smelling the mutilated remains of the body in this shed. I had not considered the madness caused by that scent when I left it there. I, instead, continued to chew on my bits of cow, crunched on the bone. I typically left nothing to waste. It would be enough. I licked my mouth and wiped my claws across my toothy snout for any residual blood from my dinner. Then, shock overtook me as I heard once again that same ravenous howl from outside. I heard snorting of a mad beast and a crash outside my tool shed. Then, a loud, sorrowful howl. I howled back, enraged. I was not in the mental state to make assessments, but did feel, even in my likened state, that something was not right. That this should not be. I heard the shed being ripped apart. Howls and growls and insanity. I was not cognizant of how I might leave my enclosure. Of course, I was mindful that I was trapped and that this thing had returned. If I were sensible enough to consider that I had indeed ridden myself of the beast when I eviscerated young Liam with the gardening shears, then I would be most beyond confused. Yet this was the case. I stood a confused, dumb beast sniffing an enemy in the air while it emerged into my domicile. I could hear my entire home being torn apart. Nothing left to murder but me. Again, this mindless creature, only knowing rage and hunger, was locked helplessly in a cage. Unable to escape and unable to fight, it was a matter of time before this surprising entrance was made into my cellar. Then it was. This gargantuan, hideous, silver-eyed demon smashed open the door to my cellar. I awaited its reveal. Yet again, something was not right. Even in my dense, inane, lecherous brain, a mistake had been made. The beast walked down the stairs, as it did that last evening. This time, in the luminescence of the candles that lit up the subterranean chamber, that was my private place, my nightly respite. It was the same massive animal that I knew. It was holding something in the shadows. Then, it presented it to me, the head of young Liam. I roared at it, not knowing what this meant if I could assemble any critical thought in my head. It tossed his head at my cage, towards my feet. I stepped back. I remained confused but immensely hostile. I tore at my bars, wanting to attack this intruder. Yet again, I shook the bars and somewhere in my feeble mind I knew the way out. I had vaguely uncovered the escape mechanism buried deep in my rage-filled mind. The key. Somehow, I knew of the key and looked back and forth for it. While the ginger beast stared at me, I saw it to my right and reached for it. My arms, too massive to get through the narrow bars, I pushed and pushed. I could feel my muscles tearing as my desperation pushed myself to reach it. I was not aware that this beast had its own plan, other than simply watching me. It seemed vengeful as it threw the candles towards the cloth and dried wood in the cellar corner. Then, at the dried grass at my feet, the cellar <coughs> began to smoke. I coughed and continued wrestling my arm through for the key. I turned back at the visitor once again <coughs> while straining for my salvation and it just stared at me 
with those glowing eyes, baring its teeth as if to smirk at me. <coughs> coughing and shaking the bars to get me access to the key for the first time <laughs> and ultimately the final time I felt lucid I seemed to remember my life my <laughs> my human form my <laughs> oh, my fur caught fire and I howled it spread quickly up my back as I gave one last dive towards the key, cracking my humerus at the same time, yelping in pain from the break and the fire burning my back. I took hold of the key, finally, <laughs> and weakly, covered in flames, <laughs> moved towards the lock, never making it <coughs> i collapsed <gasps> engulfed in an inferno no longer able to howl <coughs> or <coughs> breathe <gasps> or live the ginger beast walked towards the shed taking one last look at his nephew's body and racing off into the forest before the villagers arrived to witness the blaze and the ruin of Langdale Manor. If you've heard of Overbrook, it's probably because of the Overbrook Impaler. What a way to put your hometown on the map, right? He's why half the world heard about our quiet coastal town. Tommy Lee Rawlings. That's how he was eventually identified. He preferred girls. The younger, the better. His M.O. was, you guessed it, impaling. Mostly with large metal spikes. Apparently, he melted down whatever he could to make them. He would crucify some of his victims, nailing them to trees and empty buildings. Other times, he would just drive his spikes wherever he felt like it. His cruelty wasn't limited to mutilation. It was only natural that rape fit into his fascination with impaling. He had Overbrook terrified. Nobody was out after dark, and everyone locked their doors. I didn't know any of this. I didn't get to see the Overbrook Impaler in the news reports. Mom and Dad would switch the TV off when either I or my little sister Eden came into the room, or they would shoo us away. He was all over the news, so Mom and Dad had to work hard. Come on, I'm nine years old, I'd protest. But they wouldn't listen. Still, no matter how ugly the truth is, you can't keep it hidden, especially from curious children who go to school with a bunch of other curious children. Kids are terrible but avid journalists. They gulp down facts and make some facts up if they think they don't have enough. I and a rotating cast of my classmates would huddle under the slide at recess and whisper what we thought we knew about the Overbrook Impaler. I contributed the least because I knew nothing. There was no structure to the discussion. We would talk over each other like drunk poker players adding chips to the pot. I heard that he only likes little girls, and when he's done killing them, he eats them. Yeah, I heard that he sticks them to the wall with giant nails and laughs at them while they die, just like Dracula. Dracula wasn't real. I mean, the dude that Dracula's based on. It was on the History Channel. You're such a nerd. My mom says he's a reaper. Your mom thinks every man is a reaper. But he is! I lost track of how many recesses we spent huddled under the shade of the slide as if it were an invisible haven. We were never tired of sharing the same general information over and over. We would imagine that he was in the bushes that dotted the school's perimeter, or hiding in the clumps of trees that divided up yards and properties. 
He was always imagined to be watching from a distance. I would stare, barely breathing, trying to catch a glimpse of the monster in his hiding place. Summer? Summer! The supervisors would say, making me jump out of my skin. This was always when most of the kids were back inside and I had tuned out the bell. I had developed a picture of the Overbrook Impaler that wasn't even human. Anyone that did such horrible things couldn't be. He had to be tall and brutish with horns and claws. When I finally saw him, he was nothing like what I had been expecting. I was at the supermarket with my mom and my little sister. Mom was looking at the salads and I was gazing around at all the colorful vegetables. My eyes were drawn to a flash of blue. It came from a pair of eyes that belonged to a tall, slender man. Most of his hair was gone. His nose was sharp and wolfish and his teeth seemed large and square like cinder blocks. If they had been pointed, they would have poked out through the parting of his lips. I had never seen his face before, but I had seen his eyes before. That look. I had seen it in a book at school, in a chapter that explained what a predator and prey were. The word prey accompanied a picture of a bug-eyed rabbit. The picture for predator was a gray and black wolf. Its pupils were contracted to pinpoints. They were staring into the camera, through the camera, through the page, and into my soul. That's the look that the Overbrook Impaler had. The very first time I laid eyes on him, his eyes were already on me. Staring at the pictures of the wolf and the rabbit, my mind filled up with questions that most teachers feel too underpaid to answer. Is a rabbit still prey if there are no predators? I've seen nature programs where wolves are eating seeds and berries. Is the wolf still a predator? Is prey prey and a predator a predator only when they're near each other? Do they depend on each other for those roles? I had contemplated every angle except the penetrating hunger in the eyes of that wolf. It didn't mean anything to me until I saw that man in the store. Of course, I didn't know who he was. Summer, do you want any fruits or anything? My mother said, making me jump. I looked at her disoriented. I, uh, sure, I'd like some oranges for breakfast, I guess, I said. I looked around for the wolf man, but he was gone. More accurately, I just couldn't see him anymore. But I thought about him. Nobody had ever looked at me like that before. It was intense. Maybe he was just intensely friendly. I almost brought it up with mom. Looking back, I don't think it would have made any difference. Back home, we went to the relative safety of the Johnson family estate. The neighborhood was exclusive, but the property that our home sat on was also exclusive, separate from the neighborhood. The sort of place that has signs in the driveway that say, Private property, private drive. If you need to turn around, do it now, not later. You couldn't even see the closest neighbor from our home. That was as much due to the trees as much as distance. As a nine-year-old girl, I didn't appreciate the loneliness as I should have. There are worse things in the world than an ancestral house nestled beneath trees with private ponds and acres of wilderness. There wasn't anything eccentric about my parents. They were just secretive. Dad wore this heavy old key around his neck on a leather strap. It didn't go to anything in the house that I knew of. When I asked him about it, he was dismissive. My family had a long-running reputation of not appreciating visitors, but there were a few exceptions. The children of our closest neighbor, the Hills, were okay for some reason, Big, burly Brayden Hill and his little sister, Bethany. Brayden was 13, so he didn't have much in common with me. Bethany was six, closer to Eden's age. I was kind of alone, even when we had company. 
which was a strange feeling since Brayden and Bethany were with us every chance they got. They didn't mind the trek from their door to ours. My parents always acted like visitors would find out something that they weren't supposed to. But Brayden was autistic and Bethany was innocent, so that somehow granted them clearance. They also tolerated Brayden and Bethany's insistence on being with us for car trips. This made for cramped quarters on routine visits to the grocery store. We were kids. We didn't care. We liked it. It made the family feel bigger. One ordinary Sunday, we were piled into the backseat of the car like a bunch of silly sardines. Me and Eden and Brayden and Bethany Hill. Mom had to make a super quick run to the grocery store. There really wasn't any point in us tagging along, but we wanted out of the house. The Hill kids wanted out of theirs, and it was a beautiful summer day. It puzzled me how Mom tried so hard to talk Brayden and Bethany out of going with us. But at the last, she gave in. Along the way, Mom switched on the news on the radio. A report began to play about how the Overbrook Impaler had struck again. She immediately turned it off. Why can't we listen to the news, Mrs. J? Bethany asked, but Mom didn't answer her. A while later, I heard Mom say something aggressive under her breath as she looked at the gas gauge. Kids, I'll need to pull over to fuel up. And that was the first time I had ever seen Mom park in front of a gas station that wasn't a miniature shopping mall. This was more like an abandoned shack that barely turned enough business. The pumps weren't even digital. How desperate were we? She filled up while we kids marveled at the stillness. It wasn't like the stillness of home. It was different, lonelier. It was broken by the ding of a brass bell when the tank was full. Wait, here. I'm going inside to pay, Mom said. The stillness deepened when we kids were by ourselves. Well, we thought we were by ourselves. No sooner had Mom disappeared inside the gas station than a man came out of nowhere. The first thing I saw was his eyes. It was him. The man with the wolf eyes. All of us froze in place at the sight of him. I was seated in the middle and I leaned sharply to make sure that the car doors were locked. Hey, ow! Eden protested. We need to lock the doors now, I said. All four doors gave a solid click just in time for the wolfman to try the driver's door. A wave of relief washed over me. It was short-lived. The wolfman bent over and picked something up. He then dangled it in front of the windshield. It rang like small wind chimes. It was Mom's car keys. She had dropped them on her way out. We panicked. We screamed. The bodies of each of us were in motion. We were too cramped together for us to do any good. The wolfman slid into the driver's seat, started the car, and drove off like we were his. The Impaler kept looking back at us. Nobody moves. <gasps> Nobody dies. <sighs> he lied. You could hear him grunt with each exhale like a hungry wolf. Several times I thought of grabbing his head or pushing my fingers into his eyes. Maybe even just opening the car door and running or something, anything but I couldn't think of anything that didn't end in a car crash or being chased down by him. So we sat there and trembled like rabbits locked in his jaws. I didn't recognize where he was taking us. All I could tell was that it was far away, near the sea and someplace without houses. I felt like I was being swallowed alive into some great blackness of no return. I wondered how he planned to handle all of us at once. Four of us and one of him. Perhaps we had a chance when he started putting hands on us. I got my answer when he pulled over and got out of the car. He turned the AC on full blast. He opened a dirty rucksack and took with him what looked like a bleach bottle with a label torn off. He popped the hood of the car. Now's our chance, I hissed. I'm scared, said Bethany. 
We do this now or we don't do it at all. He's distracted. Go! Brayden had the presence of mind to try and unlock the door. No matter how he pawed at it, the lock held. It shouldn't have been doing that. Try the buttons in the front seat, I commanded. Brayden's bulky frame lunged over the seat like a struggling seal. His hand stopped just short of the buttons before going limp. I was about to yell at him when a sharp chemical smell filled the cabin and the world melted away. I woke up feeling cold and wet. Had I really peed myself in fear? No. I was inside some kind of prison cell that had been carved out of solid rock. I was in disgusting and smelly water that came up to my elbows as I was propped against the rough-hewn wall. The only opening was blocked by a grate of straight and heavy iron bars. The bars closest to the water looked like they had been slowly gnawed away by time. My first impulse was to do what everyone in the movies does, run up to the bars and grab them, but my hands and legs were bound with layers of duct tape. Eden, Brayden, and Bethany were in that cell with me, propped up with their heads between their knees, still asleep. A pang of fear hit me that if any of them fell over, they could drown. The cell. If you've ever seen a dungeon cell in a fantasy film, that was it. Underground, wet, and crude. Needlessly miserable. Instead of torches, oil lamps. The kind common at farm supply stores, hung here and there. We had just enough light to be afraid. A choking sob announced that Bethany was waking up. By the time we were all awake, we sat and stared at each other like frightened mice. We were prey, and we were terrified. Brayden only ever had one facial expression for as long as I knew him. Neutral. But he leaned over to me with brave words. The tape holding my hands is coming undone because of the water. When he comes for us, I'll beat him up, and we can get out of here. That was the kind of good news I needed to hear. The hope that I felt had a lot of weight riding on it, pressing down by nagging thoughts like, what if he isn't coming back for us? What if he's just going to leave us here to starve to death? Oh, he came for us all right. He held up his oil lamp and looked us over. There was a light in his eyes, separate from the lamp, the embers of hunger. My, my. What a catch. His teeth gleamed like ivory tombstones as his tongue massaged them. His focus narrowed on Bethany. What's your name, sweet little thing? She could only manage a few frightened peeps. For this, she was blasted with a deafening roar. Answer me, you little slut. I'm Bethany. Bethany. Ah, oh, Bethany. You look so <sighs> tasty. She started whimpering, and you could tell he was aroused. He grabbed the bars with one hand and leaned back, throwing his face skyward. Tasty! He shouted. In his exuberance, the arm with the lantern swung and it shattered against the wall in a fireball. Look what you made me do! He growled before sloshing off. This is it. When he comes back, I'm going for it. Brayden whispered. I looked him over. He was burly for his age. The Impaler was taller but much skinnier. He just might be able to do it. Hope settled on my heart like a butterfly, and I didn't dare breathe and risk scaring it away. Within minutes, we heard splashing footsteps returning, along with a chant of Tasty, tasty, tasty! Tasty, tasty, tasty! He hung the lamp up on a hook somewhere and got to unlocking the door. Brayden's body tensed like a compressed spring. 
Bethany was transfixed by the Impaler, shaking her head side to side and wearing a look of mounting panic. He went for her. She screamed and my ears rang. Brayden's arms were free and he began pummeling the Impaler. The monster was definitely caught off guard. A flurry of blows landed in his face, to which the Impaler stood at his full height to escape. Then, Brayden drove into his gut. I opened my mouth to cheer Brayden on, but flecks of blood spattered my tongue, my lips, and my eyes. A crimson line appeared across Brayden's throat as he staggered back, and the Impaler held a machete streaked with blood. It plunged into Brayden's stomach like a bolt of stainless steel lightning. The hand on the knife made a downward jerking motion, and bright red innards slithered out into the water, making smacking plops. Brayden fell and shuffled on his hands and knees, staring at his ropey insides that bobbed in the water under his face. He took a handful and lifted them as if he were going to try and put them back. He face-planted into the water and stopped moving. Bethany was petrified. The monster snapped his face toward her before throwing his head back and once again screaming, Tasty! Bethany babbled her pleas for mercy. She even started asking him to take either me or my sister instead of her. I was appalled. I still feel bad for blaming her in the moment. He grabbed her by her hair and hauled her off. She screamed and gyrated and thrashed the entire way as he tried to shout over her. Tasty, tasty, tasty. There was a moment of relative quiet before the demon got to work. The awfulness of the sounds that echoed through the cavern is beyond my vocabulary. The only thing worse was how long they lasted. I'm not sure, but I think I fell asleep from shock, unable to process Bethany's agony any longer. She eventually fell into silence, but the Impaler continued making strange, loathsome sounds for long after. I looked at Eden. Her eyes were glassy and unfocused. Parts of Brayden floated near me, touching my leg. I recoiled back and tested my bonds. That flash of luck must have only been Brayden's. My hands were as fast as ever. I strained against the tape until my wrists screamed. My ankles were the same no matter how I twisted and stretched. I gave up, like prey swallowed alive, trying to climb out of a stomach. My love for my sister would stoke my will to fight, but my body was spent, and my mental health was blasted. I watched Brayden and his guts drift to a corner of the cell. He would undulate slightly, and I would hope that he was still alive, but he wasn't. He got out the fastest because the Overbrook Impaler only likes girls, I thought. And guess what, Summer? You're a girl. I wasn't ready for the Impaler to come back when he did. It was too soon. Not that any time would have been good. He looked at me only briefly. What's your name, tiny girl? He said to my sister. Eden. Who? <gasps> I like that name. It sounds sweet, like forbidden fruit. So tasty. Tasty! He shouted the word at the ceiling again, and then he started to unlock the door. Leave her alone! I sputtered. Take, take me instead! You'll have to wait your turn. No, please, take me. Take me! Take me! Just let her go! He scooped her up. All her wriggling did her no good, and the stimulation was visible in his face. He ran down the corridor like a football player, shouting, Tasty! 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 My mind did something where I had no thoughts. 
Stimuli came in, but nothing was processed. Nothing could be processed. Silence hung in the air for one excruciating moment of punctuation. At Eden's first scream, my vision blurred, my ears rang, my skin felt like it was frying on a hot griddle. I felt like I was going to burst. Maybe I did. Surely I was hallucinating because I tore my bonds like they were made of cobwebs. <laughs> I flew onto the bars like a leopard. They groaned under my twisting grasp, but wouldn't yield. So I backed up and launched myself at them with cannonball force. I did it again and again. They were starting to buckle. I did it again. Eden's screaming started to sound inhuman. I plowed into those bars even harder yet. But that's what knocked me out. What a strange dream, I thought, as I felt the water filling my nose before I blacked out. Steady beeping was the first thing to reach my senses. It sounded medical. It sounded sane. It sounded safe. I didn't dare get my hopes up that I was finally someplace safe. The Impaler's hideout was as inaccessible as a tomb. But when I opened my eyes, the blurred double image of a nurse greeted me. She was leaning down to look at me. The two images joined in the center of my vision to become one nurse. Are you in there, Miss Johnston? She said. She sounded like my ears were full of water. I was able to see past her just enough to tell that there was somebody else in the room. In the bed behind her, I could see hair sprawled out on the pillow of the other hospital bed. It was the color of Eden's hair. The nurse split into two people again as I drifted off again. I thought I was out for just a few seconds, but the room wasn't as bright that time. There was no sunlight peeking around the curtains. I felt a little stronger, even though there was a hammer striking an anvil in my head. I gazed at the other bed. Eden faced me as she lay on her pillow, eyes closed. Her blanket slowly rose and fell. How was she alive? My mind raced to the possibilities of what all she had endured before she ended up here. She shifted in her sleep. She brought her hand up and slipped it under her cheek. I could see her wrist. I expected it to be bandaged up from a wound inflicted by the impaler, but there was nothing but a faint, dark spot, like a bruise. Questions trickled into my brain, but I was just happy for the moment that my sister was safe. We could heal together. I wouldn't have to weather the process by myself. Nurses brought us food. I was hungry. Eden wasn't. She wouldn't make eye contact with the staff, with me, or anyone. She wouldn't say a word. Her eyes flicked around and she trembled no matter how many blankets they gave her. My dread deepened. That wasn't my sister. Whatever was left of her was broken and wounded and hunkered down inside her shell, too afraid to come out to see even her own flesh and blood. I talked to her as I ate, even though she wouldn't say anything back. Just before we were released, a couple of policemen came by our room. There was something about them that I didn't like. They looked at us funny. It wasn't the same as the wolf eyes that the Impaler had but there certainly wasn't any warmth or reassurance. They were wary and on edge, as if they were prey. With patently false smiles, they told me and my sister that they would want to speak to us after we were home and had some time to settle back into our lives. I honestly didn't think we had lives to settle back into. When we did go home, it felt like coming home to a heap of rubble left behind by bombs. Our parents were so quiet I figured they just weren't sure what to say, but I wish they'd say something, or ask something, anything. They made me feel like radioactive waste that they were too afraid to touch. The first few days we just sat in each other's presence when we could. 
I wish that they would ask something deeper than, are you hungry? Something less safe. But now, everything they said was safe. I don't remember the last time I felt so alone in my own home. I tried to be there for Eden, but she was still silent, borderline catatonic, beyond reach. She stayed in her room, either sleeping or staring, so I sat in her room with her and stared out the window. One day that blurred with all the other days, Mom came in to tell us that the police were on their way to ask us some questions. She had readied a dining room for the meeting with hot tea and rolls. She encouraged us to cooperate with them. It struck me that she seemed uncomfortable in a way that I couldn't place, which was ridiculous. Weren't we the victims? Was she eaten up with guilt over dropping the car keys or what? I barely recognized the two policemen when they arrived, but I recognized the way they carried themselves. Like prey, wary and cautious, giving us a wide berth. They sat down at a coffee table between two love seats, they on one and myself and Eden on the other. When they reached for their tea, they did it with overly extended arms, as if they were afraid to lean in towards us. Mother left the room, leaving me and Eden alone with the officers. The senior officer feigned his best warm smile. Ladies, I appreciate you talking to us so soon after your ordeal. We've got some questions for you. We'll need you to revisit as much of what happened to you as possible. I realize what we're asking of you. Please, give us as much as you can so we can sort all this out. I just shrugged. I guess the sooner we do this, the sooner you catch him. They exchanged a look with each other. I didn't know what it meant, but it felt wrong. Uh, yes. Now, let's start from the beginning. For me, the beginning was in the grocery store. I could trace the dots from there with lines the color of adrenaline. The events leading up to Eden's assault were buried in a haze of panic and nausea. The officers bled a little warmth from their expressions when I told them about Bethany, but that wary aura of prey returned to them when I got around to what happened to Eden. Instead of softening, they were hardening. More on guard. The way they were behaving, well, it should have been saved for interrogating the Impaler if they ever got their hands on him. I couldn't take it anymore. Look, I know you guys are just doing your job, but you've been looking at me funny this whole time, and you've been looking at each other funny. There's something here you're not telling me. This monster did horrible things to my family and our friends. Do you know something? Please, I don't want to be in the dark. The officers exchanged another look, albeit a restrained one. You're doing it again! What is that? I can see it! Do you know where he is or what? Both of them shifted. You're very perceptive, Miss Johnston. There's a great deal we don't know and your story is only deepening the mystery. Well, I'm telling you what I know. I'm not hiding anything. The officer put up both of his hands. I believe you. Trust me. I will tell you that we indeed found the overbroke impaler. My jaw dropped. We found him some distance from where you were. His arms and legs had been torn from his body. One of the spikes that I suppose he was fond of using ran through the back of his throat, fastening him to a cliffside overlooking the water. The other officer spoke up. That cliff is at the top of a sheer vertical drop that no average person could climb. It would be insane to manage to hang a body while climbing. The elder officer nodded and jumped in. The only reason we were able to find him was that your sister led us to him. We found her alongside the road, about three miles from you. Now, for the Overbrook Impaler, not only had he been relieved of his limbs, which would allow us to comfortably judge that he ran into a hungry bear, his intestines had been wrapped around his neck and tied in a bow. That's not the malice of an animal. Now, whoever did this to the Overbrook Impaler is a hero for sure. 
but also possibly a worse killer. And right now, the only person of interest in that devil's death is your poor dear sister. She was slathered in blood when we found her. I felt the wind leave my lungs. Person of interest? Now you understand where we're coming from. Surely there was another person involved. Little Eden here is what, seven? Unless the full moon turned her into some sort of demon, someone else made the kill in close proximity to her, set her free, or she got away. So please, we're a little baffled. I looked at Eden, and there was a keenness of a razor in her eyes, but she avoided looking directly at anyone. Has she said anything at all? Asked the senior officer. She hasn't even coughed. Uh, it's probably too soon to press her with questions then. But I do thank you for helping us. They got up and excused themselves and Mom showed them out. I stared at Eden who in turn stared deep into her cup of cold tea. Eden, do you know who killed the Impaler? I said. Her eyes shifted to look at me from their corners, but she said nothing. That sent a chill through me. She knew, and I felt like I knew too, but I couldn't have put it into words if you had held a gun to my head. The nights darkened as the moon waned and waned. It took me a while to catch on that Eden wasn't just staring out the window. She was watching the moon. Whichever window of the house provided a view of it, that's where she was. When it was cloudy, she was in her room staring at nothing. Her appetite did improve. Her hands shook when she ate, but at least she ate. The moon began to wax, and her demeanor took on a peculiar change. I'd stand beside her, trying to decode what was in her eyes. A few nights before the proper full moon, I found an unexpected change in myself. She was watching the moon from the family dining room. I was going to stand with her for a few minutes before helping her to bed. But as I got near her, I heard a sound. Something like a heartbeat. It got louder as I got closer to her. It was clear as a bell. I thought I was losing my mind, but I put my ear to her chest and it was the same sound. I grew afraid. I paced around her, testing the strange experience. I could hear it from as far away as 20 steps. With each following night, I could hear it from anywhere in the house. To complicate matters, I could hear mom and dad's hearts, too. The night of the full moon came. I had gone to bed early and fell into vivid dreams about a hole in the floor of my cell. I dreamed that I was able to wriggle down inside. The impaler had come for me, and I held my breath and dove into the hole out of desperation. A ghostly light barely lit my surroundings as I sank like a stone. I saw Bethany's ravaged body, her hair floating about her scarred face. Mom and Dad were down there, staring at me without expression, their eyes tracking me. I wanted to call out for help, but I didn't dare let the water in my lungs. I sank until there was nothing, until there was a heartbeat. My sister emerged out of the murk. Her head snapped to look at me. Her eyes were solid black. I lost my breath in shock and the freezing water rushed inside my chest. I panicked for a few seconds until I realized that I was breathing. It was like winter air. My sister darted off with superhuman speed, and that's when I woke up. Our room was always dark, but I could see quite clearly. Also, I could hear everything. Mom and Dad's hearts through the walls of their bedroom the scuttling of a woodlouse in the wall, something bigger creeping across the carpet like a mouse. I looked around for Eden. She wasn't in her bed. I was out of bed in an instant, but I landed on my feet unsteadily. Had my head come within an inch of hitting the ceiling? 
Not even Daddy could touch the ceiling with an outstretched arm. This daunted me for only a moment. I could hear Eden's heart coming from outside. Our bedroom window was open. My throat tightened at the notion that she had gone out onto the roof. I had a brief vision of her being so overcome by her trauma that she committed suicide. But her heartbeat reassured me. The balmy night breeze kissed me as soon as I moved through the window onto the roof. From there, I could hear other hearts that were arrhythmic, as though with grief. They were coming from the direction of the home of the Hill family. Was I really hearing the broken hearts of Brayden and Bethany's parents? I looked up at the full moon, and an electric madness took me. I stopped thinking in words. It was pure thought, like a newborn baby or an animal. I homed in on the sound of my sister's heart, and I leapt off the roof and landed on my feet in a spray of turf. I didn't even stop to contemplate such insanity. I sprinted off at the speed of shadow, barely feeling the ground beneath me. The moon's glow was like silver sunlight all around me. Trees passed by in a smudged blur. I felt overstimulated and intoxicated, and I loved it. I found my sister standing at the edge of a large pond or a small lake, depending on how you looked at it. She turned to me. Her eyes were the color of a candle's flame. Her pupils were the shape of an hourglass, like in the eyes of a goat or an octopus. Her hair writhed as it was a nest of tentacles with spines in the center of each sucker. There was an array of small tentacles along each jaw. Gills flared on the sides of her neck. Before I could cry out, my own reflection in the water caught my attention. I had no business being afraid of Eden's appearance, because I looked just like her. Worse, actually. I had several pairs of eyes that blinked independently of each other. They widened my field of view so that I could even see the tips of my ears. Small clusters of tentacles and, I guess, sensory organs bristled along the length of my arms. My mind would have broken if it weren't for what I heard next. There were two more hearts that were racing, but not with fear. Their vibrations echoed through the water. Then there were hushed words. Mark, we shouldn't be out here. That mania could be stalking us. Haven't you been watching the news? I have been watching the news, Candy. Someone killed the Overbrook Impaler. So we don't need to worry. We're fine out here. Maybe he was killed by another crazy person, like someone worse. Pure instinct spread through my veins. It felt warm. It felt good. My sister slithered into the water with a grace that made water snakes look clumsy. I slipped in after her, where the pulsing lust of two teens was in my ears. I could taste their sweat and other body fluids in the water. I could smell the iron in their blood. That's when I completely lost control. What happened next, I only remember in snapshots. I remember human flesh tearing as easily as wet toilet paper. Ribbons of quivering, living flesh sliding off of bones and vertebra contracting like clams ripped from their shells. Hearts that were hammering so fast that they were nearly a constant hum. A face looking into mine as the many tentacles at my disposal peeled flesh from around the eyes, no longer able to close without eyelids, no longer able to hide from the horror, no longer able to hide from me. As you might have guessed, my next moment of awareness was waking up in my bed. As you might have also guessed, I was relieved to think that my memory of mutating and butchering two skinny-dipping teenagers was a dream. I normally felt hungry after my first trip to the bathroom. 
I didn't. I felt sated. There was an aftertaste in my mouth, like the faint flavor of water from a garden hose. Dad poked his head in our bedroom. You're back, he said. Back? I haven't been anywhere, Dad. You and your sister both went out last night, he said as he tilted his head toward the open window. My mouth hung open as I looked to the window, then to my sister. Her eyes were clearer. Awareness and vigor sparkled in them. I could tell she was in there again, but they were the eyes of the wolf in that textbook. The eyes of the Overbrook Impaler. I searched Dad's face for any of the astonishment or dismay I was feeling, but instead there was a satisfaction that chilled me. I felt my throat tightening. Daddy, I choked out as my anxiety ramped up. Only a shred of warmth bled into his eyes. He drew up his lucky key from inside his shirt. You've always wondered what this was for. It's finally time that I got to show you. Both of you, come with me to the car. Only when Eden obeyed and left the room did I follow. The car ride was silent. Alarm bells started going off in my head before I knew what was setting them off. It eventually hit me. We were driving out to where the Impaler had kept us. My disbelief grew as the entrance to the grotto drew near, but we didn't stop there. We kept going. The road became narrow and treacherous as it wound up to an outcropping of rock that formed a high cliff overlooking the rolling waves of the sea. I saw pieces of yellow police tape caught in the sparse, scraggly vegetation. I recalled what the policeman had told us about how the impaler was found, nailed to a high cliff. Dad just managed to park the car somewhere it wouldn't fall and led the way towards the cliff. There was a set of twisting, rough-hewn stairs that were invisible from far away. They carried us to the top of the outcropping, which felt like the top of the world. I felt like I was on the precipice of something ancient, something forbidden, and I was right. That was the first time I had ever seen Daddy take his lucky key off. He moved several of the stone slabs at his feet, and there was a stone door held fast by a rusty but heavy padlock. It yielded to the key with a clunk that sounded like a relic from a forgotten world. Stone stairs wound down into shadow. As if by magic, strange geometric stones glowed with a cold, quivering light that was both sickly green and pale blue. The steps hinted that we were in a cavern, but the interior was very much lived in. There were paintings on the walls of people that resembled mommy and daddy. Worn books lined shelves that were cut from expensive but aging wood. There were also scrolls. Their handles were made of something gleaming white and knobby. More lights were winging on. They resembled those weird-shaped dice that I had seen people use to play Dungeons and Dragons. We stopped inside some sort of great dome carved inside the rock. There was a great mass of shadow that resisted the lights, but once enough of them were shining, I saw that the shadow was something carved out of the blackest rock I had ever seen. An altar, twisting, heavy, contorted, porous, a blasphemous mass of shapes that all suggested screams, anguish, and mind-bending terror. Clusters of things resembling evil barnacles and carbuncles and tumors fruited all about the monstrous thing. Even the candles were black, resembling knotted fingers of old men. The only smooth surface was the platform for the offering. It was like an obsidian mirror rimmed with gold. Something about the altar made me feel like my soul had been bored out and filled with nothing, like a hung and dressed deer. Daddy reached for something among the Stygian mass of the altar, a shimmering green robe. He slid it on over his clothes and turned to face us as he slowly spread his arms with open palms. He raised his voice and a bass note caused the entire dome to tremble. 
he closed his eyes and allowed the lingering vibrations to die off. O oh, Father, Daroth Ligon, devourer of the depths, from the blood of our lineage, two new children of the pact awaken. Hunters once again stalk the earth in your name. The dome trembled under the power of Daddy's voice, but then it trembled from something else, something outside the rock walls. A black cloud congealed over the altar, an opening slid into view from inside the cloud. An eye. It was the size of a beach ball and its gaze rolled from me to my sister. A voice deeper and louder than thunder filled my head and showed me everything I never wanted to know about our family. I saw the pact that our earliest ancestors made with these horrifying monsters beneath the sea. I saw their palaces in the darkest depths that were furnished with strange shapes meant for the comfort of beings that were nothing like humans. Their walls were carved in base reliefs that chronicled a history stretching into eons, all hidden from human eyes underwater. In exchange for the blessings of this unspeakable thing, Daroth Ligon, someone in my lineage had cohabited with its spawn. This meant that every few generations, someone was born with the ability to manifest the likeness of the terrible water deity. But that ability would be dormant until it would be awoken by severe trauma. This was normally inflicted through rituals. I got to see those, too. My ancestors being burned, cut, and, yes, impaled on the night of a full moon until they turned into a werewolf of the water. In order to hold off the displeasure of the Daroth Lygon, there would need to be hunters that walk the earth every few generations. At the last, I saw a vision of myself and Eden being held by the Overbrook Impaler. I saw what really happened to us. As soon as he had ripped Eden's clothes off and driven a spike through one wrist, she turned. He never had a chance to do anything to her past that. She used her new form to mutilate him and still make sure he died in torment as slowly as possible. It was that spike in her wrist that mounted him to the rock face of the cliff. Me hearing Eden's suffering was enough trauma to cause me to turn. The whole time that I had thought Eden's body was being penetrated with iron and flesh, the Impaler was being put through an experience authored by the wrath of a little girl turned demon. But I didn't know that. It was enough to shatter whatever prison held the demon inside of me. I saw us attacking the teenage lovers in the lake. The missing detail is that when we took their bones stripped of flesh, and arranged them at the bottom of the water in a formation around a black obelisk and an inky blackness manifested to consume those bones as our first offering. And just like that, we were back in the dome with Daddy. He was removing the green robe, apparently concluding whatever had just taken place. Daddy, I said with shivering lungs. Yes, Summer? That day we were kidnapped. Was that supposed to happen? We did the community a favor. Nobody would get suspicious of our family if a notorious serial killer disappeared. Daddy looked down into his hands. When I looked at him, he looked every bit like a stranger to me. So you planned on having the Impaler find us? We needed a way to bring about your awakening without drawing attention to us. You surely notice that the Devourer of the Depths isn't subtle about his presence. The old awakening rituals are terribly cruel and drawn out. My voice was becoming shrill. I can't believe this! What about Brayden and Bethany? Your mother tried to discourage them, but it wouldn't have been like us to refuse them. 
and that's a chrome that police could have picked up on. You served us and our friends on a plate to the Impaler! Fresh victims for the worst killer ever! But you're not victims. You're hunters. And those were the words that froze me inside out. Daddy had the eyes of a wolf. After the trauma of being prey, I turned around to find that I was a predator. Brayden and Bethany were definitely prey, but like a true predator, Daddy didn't care. Mom didn't care. I was appalled at the idea of transforming into a bloodthirsty monster every full moon to butcher, devour, and make an offering to something evil. But I did. I didn't have a choice. I was a werewolf. Or a werefish? Were thing. I was a predator, and I had to obey my nature. Every full moon, I got to pour out my hunger and undiluted rage on people that I probably saw at the grocery store. A few, I'm sure, were in my school. Months later, the news was talking about another serial killer on the loose in Overbrook, one that was trying to outdo the Impaler. The police dropped by from time to time to check on Eden and I. Sometimes they asked if we might know anything, but they never suspected that they were chatting with the predators of Overbrook. It ended in 2047. It was the flu, or some evolution of it anyway, and when it took the world, it took it fast. Everyone forgot all about COVID. It was a distant memory, a cold in comparison to the new disease. It was in every country in a matter of days, and it killed by the millions. Everett was one of the survivors. Whether or not he was one of the lucky ones was still to be decided. He sat in a rocking chair on the front porch of a white house somewhere in the south. Cities and states didn't really matter anymore. This house was far nicer than the one he started with, and it was old, classic. It felt cozy. He liked it. He took the house when he was forced to run from his own wife. The thought disgusted him, but this was the world the disease had left him. Not that the disease had left. It lingered like a fart in a locked car with the windows up. It got everyone eventually. Everett had seen enough of it to know. They covered rooms and walls in bleach. They wore masks. They burned the dead and everything they touched, and they still got sick. It would just come out of nowhere one day. It started with a cough. Then came the fever and the vomiting, the diarrhea, the body aches and chills. Then the end. Days like today, Everett sat rocking on the porch in the sun rays that pierced the shadows, wondering why he was still alive. There was no way to not feel survivor's guilt. He was no better than anyone, certainly not his brother's daughter who was only 12 when the disease ravaged her. At least it was merciful enough to take her parents a couple of days later and not leave them to live with the pain of her loss. That whole family was better and worth more to the world than Everett. His brother was a doctor, an oncologist that worked with children. His wife was a social worker and their daughter was a great kid, straight A's and dreams of being president one day. Maybe she could have if the world had survived long enough. What was Everett? He was the manager of a grocery store. He walked out when things got bad. Grocery stores were breeding grounds for germs and Everett was afraid of death. He convinced Amy to quit the laundromat too. They didn't have any children or pets. There was nothing to tie them down, keep them from waiting for death like everybody else. So they ran. Everett would never stop seeing the end. It played behind his eyes every day. He could see it now. Everywhere he and Amy went, everyone was sweating, shaking, puking, bleeding, crying. They were crashing their cars, collapsing in the street, tugging on the pant legs of people walking by, people just starting to cough. People were falling or jumping from buildings. The sirens were a constant, 
except the emergency workers were just as sick as everyone else, and Everett knew even then it wouldn't be long before the siren stopped forever. No one was going to save them. It was just a matter of time. Everett quit smoking. He wanted to be as healthy as possible. He still sipped his whiskey from time to time, though. With this in mind, he stood from the rocking chair, though it continued to rock behind him. He stared out at the empty street without so much as a bird lurking about. If he didn't know better, he would have thought he was the last person on earth. He would have thought he was completely alone. He wasn't alone, and he wasn't safe. His eyes roamed over each tree, bush, building, window, house, telephone pole, abandoned car. He checked every shadow, every hiding place. It wasn't the sick he was looking for or the disease that he feared anymore. It was the cure, the cure that swayed his wife, that led Amy away from him and made her the enemy. It was by luck and the grace of God that Everett and Amy managed to survive the downfall to avoid the sickness. They didn't do anything that thousands of other people weren't already doing. Everett wasn't foolish enough to think that they were immune. Well, Amy was now, but that was different. He knew the virus would claim him eventually, and he had to come to terms with it. He wrote a list of things he wanted to do, and he traveled alone to check things off of the list, to live as much as he could before the sickness came for him. There was more to live for, to fight for, when Amy was still with him, but she made her choice and now he made his. He was alone in a world where no one outlived the virus and he was going to enjoy it the best he could until his death, a death he was prepared for. Death was a surefire thing in the new world when the cure was just as deadly as the sickness. Everett snarled in bitterness and entered the house, closing and locking the door behind him. He walked to the kitchen to fetch his whiskey and sneezed on the way, a reminder that even during the apocalypse you need to dust. When he got to the kitchen counter and seized the bottle with his right hand, he froze. He could hear the padding of pawed feet traipsing through the hall behind him. I knew you'd come eventually, he said without turning around. Instead, he reached up and opened the cabinet above the sink, retrieving a tumbler. He took it down and twisted the cap off the whiskey. A voice spoke from behind him. How could I not come, Everett? You're my husband. I was once, he said pouring the whiskey into the glass. I don't remember getting divorced. Everett sighed. He picked up his glass and turned around, taking a sip. Amy stood in the doorway, naked and as fit as she was on their honeymoon almost 20 years ago, but Everett felt no lust at the sight of her. There are no courts anymore, Amy. No lawyers, or I'd be happy to serve you papers. His wife, or what used to be his wife, frowned her disappointment. It doesn't have to be this way, Everett. I still love you. We were lucky enough to make it through the end. We can keep going. We can still have forever. Everett sipped from the amber liquid in his glass. No, we can't. For starters, you're a damned monster. Second, you don't have forever any more than I do. You're fooling yourself. The sickness can't get you, but it will get everyone else, me included and then you and all your new friends will die of starvation. Amy frowned again. She took a step forward, prepared to round the kitchen island and close the distance. Everett held his glass out towards her. Liquid splashed over the side. Don't. Amy sighed. Her naked shoulders slumped. She shook her head. Don't you get it, Everett? If you don't come with me, if you don't join us, the others will come for you. You're right, okay? Food is dwindling can't keep them away from you forever. If they get hungry enough... Everett scoffed. He downed the rest of his glass and turned his back to Amy to refill it. I'm not like you, Amy. I still can't believe that you are like you. It sickens my stomach. I will not choose murder over death. You're a monster. Your new family are all monsters, and I do not consider joining them a better option. Now kindly get the hell out of my house. Out of the corner of his eye, he could see her reach out to him and then redraw her hand. His heart was pounding. He was so angry with her, so betrayed by her, but he could also feel the sadness that emanated from her. It was real, genuine. She was being truthful when she said, I want you to live. There was a moment where they stood there in silence. She was probably waiting for him to respond, but he had nothing to say. Eventually, she gave up and turned away. 
she dropped to all fours and scurried into the hallway. He cringed with disgust at the sound of her bone-breaking transformation. Everett didn't look into the hall. He focused on his drink and gave her time to leave however the hell she had come in. Then he placed the empty tumbler on the counter and cursed. In the new world, a man couldn't even get sick and die in peace. Everett knew that if Amy found him, the rest of her pack weren't far behind. He hadn't seen many people in his travels lately, which meant either they hadn't seen many people either and were hungry, or there were no people because they had already been consumed. Either way, Everett needed to move and he was pissed because he liked this house. A lot. He hurried around stuffing essentials in his backpack. As he did, he thought about the day they had found out about the cure. Wolves didn't get sick. There was something in the lupin DNA that made them immune. This extended to people who were also wolves. He and Amy had been scavenging a gas station convenience store for supplies when something leaped from the shadows. Amy had screamed from two aisles over. Everett looked up just in time to see the thing hurl itself through the air. He had a 45 caliber that had helped them get this far and he drew it from his jacket. He heard the crash and winced. When he came around the corner, the wolf had Amy pinned beneath it, drool spilling from its huge jaws to coat her face. She was crying and trying to turn away. Everett stepped carefully, doing his best to not make a sound. He stepped on an empty foil bag of chips and it crunched loudly under his foot. The beast turned away from Amy to look at him, but Everett was already close enough. He put the gun to the creature's head, thinking they were going to have meals for days by the size of it. Then something happened. The wolf started contorting and shifting. Its bones were snapping and popping, its flesh stretching and changing, its hair receding. Everett was so horrified and in awe of what was happening that he failed to pull the trigger and in little more than a moment, there was a young man, maybe in his mid-twenties, staring into the gun with fearful eyes. Please, don't, the stranger choked. Everett couldn't find his voice to respond. His wife had been attacked by a hungry wolf and now she was being straddled by a naked young man who looked upon Everett with terror filling his azure eyes. Everett's own gaze moved from the strange naked man to Amy. She was frozen by shock, staring wide-eyed at the young man that still had her pinned, her mouth agape. She was trembling. Everett hadn't seen her that frightened since the end had happened and it bothered him. He cocked the gun and the young man gasped. Please, I'm sorry, he offered, slowly raising a hand palm out. I can help you both. Make it so you don't be sick. Up, Everett told him, waving him with the gun. The naked man swallowed and slowly stood, one hand raised defensively and the other cupping his genitals. Amy slid out from under him and scrambled across the floor like a beaten puppy. Shaking fingers fumbled in her coat until she found her buoy knife. She pulled it out and held it before her, hands still trembling. Who are you? Everett asked. What are you? My name is James. I'm a lycanthrope. I'm immune. We all are. You can be too. You were going to eat my wife, Everett said, jabbing the gun at him. The young man swallowed again and nodded nervously. I was. You're right. I'm sorry. My pack sent me out to hunt. Food is not as plentiful as it used to be. Because of the sickness, Amy said, getting to her feet and shaking less now. But it doesn't affect you. The boy glanced her way for a moment, long enough to shake his head. Then, his fearful gaze returned to the gun. Listen, I can turn you, make you like us, then you can survive this thing, no more sickness. Everett grimaced. You eat people. The boy swallowed once more and nodded. We eat everything, it's survival, but when people are gone, we will still be here, and we will eat something else. What? I don't know. He shook his head. Well, James, I think the world is dangerous enough without having to compete with monsters. Everett put the barrel against the naked man's forehead. James was shivering, probably in part from being naked on a cool fall day and partly because he was scared. Everett didn't care. He didn't see how he could possibly let the guy go. The moment they turned their backs on him, he could turn back to his wolf form and tear them to pieces. Everett felt like he had no choice. He had to kill him. Then something grabbed his arm. He kept his head forward, but his eyes rolled to the side. Amy was there, shaking her head. He could kill us, Everett said without turning to face her. Even if he doesn't, the disease certainly will eventually. The sickness gets everyone, Everett. 
Finally, Everett glanced his wife's direction. What are you saying? Just that we should hear him out. Put the gun down. Everett growled like he was the wolf. He didn't want to let his guard down after seeing how fast the man had made the change from one form to the other. He backed up one step, then another, and another, but kept the gun pointed at James. I'll hear him out, but I'm not putting the gun down. James nodded. Okay, I get it. Okay, just listen. My pack is small. We can afford to add a couple. It'll be all right. All I have to do is bite you once in my wolf form. I won't do real damage, I promise. I just have to get my saliva into your bloodstream. Then it takes 24 hours, but even during that time period, you will be immune to the sickness. As soon as you have me in you, it will no longer be a threat to you. Everett scoffed. But I will turn into a giant beast and eat people. That's supposed to be better somehow? Isn't it? Amy asked. He can turn at will. They can still be people. They can still love and live, Everett. It's the cure. We can beat this thing. Everett glared at her angrily. I can't believe you're even entertaining this idea. What about the people you would eat to survive? He was going to eat you. You think the others aren't like you? They don't have families? Hell, they're probably better than us and more deserving of survival if you want to get real about it. Amy stepped between Everett and James, so the gun was now pointed at her. Honey, you know those people are already dead, or as good as dead at least. They're not taking anyone who isn't already going to die. That's the world we live in now. They're already dead, Everett. They're already dead. No, they're not. Will they be eventually? Yes, but everyone dies eventually. Personally, I'd rather die from natural causes than being mauled by a wolf, ripped to pieces and eaten. He spit the words out like they tasted disgusting in his mouth. He glared at her over the gun he still hadn't lowered. What if the roles had been reversed? What if he was about to eat me? Would that be okay with you? It's just the food chain, Amy? Amy frowned. Her big eyes were sad. No, of course not. Of course I want you to live, Everett. I want us both to live. Behind her, James hadn't said a word in some time. He was just nervously watching, listening. Everett couldn't help but wonder why he hadn't changed and attacked them or at least tried to make his escape. That's what he would have done in the young man's shoes. You say natural causes, Amy said to him. But there is nothing natural about what this sickness does to the human body. How many times have we seen it now? The vomit, the blood, the agony. It's not like going to sleep and not waking up, Everett. It's not a more peaceful way to go than being booed for a predator. Everett shook his head. He couldn't believe he was hearing this. That's your justification for murdering people? You were going to kill him to keep me safe, weren't you? Weren't you? Everett's lip curled, but he didn't answer the question. How is it different? Murder for survival has always been the way, hasn't it? You're no better than him. Neither am I. Why not live? Because I'm not a goddamned monster, Everett barked. He stepped to the side and pointed the gun over her shoulder at James, who was still just standing there watching and listening, waiting for them to reach an outcome, a decision on all of their futures. You want to go with him to become a monster? That's your decision. You're a grown woman, but I won't be coming with you, and there will never be an us again after that. Amy frowned. You're right, because there won't be a you. The sickness will take you, and I will keep on going, Everett. Can you make the choice to die rather than live with your wife? If you willingly make the choice to become a murderous monster, you are not my wife, he said. He backed up further, the gun pointed out before him. The man who moments ago was going to eat Amy for supper put a supportive hand on her shoulder. Everett shook his head. That was it. When James started to change again, Everett turned and ran. He didn't trust himself to be able to outrun a giant wolf, so he knew he needed a head start. He didn't truly believe the gun would be enough if it wasn't point blank like it had been. His heart broke and he felt awful for leaving his wife in the hands of a monster, but she had made her choice. As he ran, he heard her scream in pain and for a moment he stopped, considered going back, trying to save her, but then he let out a howl of his own and raced onward. That was months ago. The sickness still had yet to reach him, but Amy had gotten to him twice now, and each time she did, the rest of the pack wasn't far behind. She was still trying to convince him to make the turn. 
The others were just hungry. Everett wasn't keen on either option. He wished they would just leave him alone, go a different direction. Maybe they would have if Amy had, but she couldn't bring herself to let him go, to let him die, and she continued to track him, to follow him, city to city and state to state. He didn't believe she would ever truly stop until the sickness forced her to, or her newfound family got to him. Sometimes Everett would actually pray to get sick, to go out like everyone else, like he felt like he was supposed to, rather than be eaten by his wife's lupin friends. He would ask God to just bring him home. But the days passed, and he didn't get so much as a cough or a runny nose. Now he had to pack up and move again, and hope she would finally let him go and take the monsters elsewhere. But deep down, he knew she wouldn't. He pulled out the 45 and checked it. Satisfied, he returned it to his jacket and threw his backpack over his shoulders. Then he added a rifle as well. If it came down to it, he would shoot the wolves to save himself and whoever else was out there ready to become their next meal. They all looked the same in their wolf form, enormous and shaggy gray and white. There would be no way for him to know which one was Amy, and yet he knew that he would take the shot if he had to. He hated himself for it, but it didn't change the truth. As soon as Everett stepped back out onto the porch, he heard the howls cutting through the night. The wind picked up and the empty rocking chair beside him started its back and forth movement. He bit his lip and did his best to choke down his fear. He had to get away from this area and fast. He trotted down the steps to the walkway and hurried to the street. The rocking chair continued to sway and creak behind him. A look at the sky told him the moon was full. How fitting. He wished he could just drive out of here, but cars were useless. The roads were full of abandoned vehicles and wrecks, bones and toppled telephone poles, light poles, and mailboxes. He wouldn't make it a single block in a car before the wolves were on him, and he knew it. He had a motorbike in the last city he took residence in, but the gas station was out of gas, and it was too much of a liability to lug around when it couldn't go anywhere. Now he had the next best thing, or at least that's what he told himself. Everett looked both ways for threats and then reached under the open door of a truck on its side. There he retrieved the bicycle he hid. He turned it upright, hopped on, and pedaled like his life depended on it. The bike wasn't as fast as he would like, but it could weave around the obstructions in the road. A dog barked somewhere off in the distance and his heart jumped. Why couldn't she just let him go? He let her make her own choice. She could just extend him the same level of courtesy. The muscles in his legs burned, but he knew that he couldn't dare slow down. Not yet. The wolves were out there, and they were hungry. Maybe Amy was in deep enough with him now that she could say, no, not him, but Everett didn't want to bank on that. He kept his eyes on the road despite the rustles of movement to his left and his right, the snarls, barks, and howls that surrounded him. He was afraid, but he knew he couldn't afford to miss something and topple the bike. That would mean his death for sure. So his heart raced and his legs raced and the wheels spun as Everett jerked the handles from side to side, slicing his way between wrecked cars and around what remained of the dead. He could hear the patter of paws nearby. He didn't want to look, but he couldn't help it. The paws banged on metal hard enough to dent it. Everett quickly glanced over and saw a wolf running parallel with him. It was bounding over the cars left in the road. Everett pedaled harder. His body ached and he wanted to scream. Then the road opened up and he was flying downhill. He chanced to look back and saw the wolf atop a car at the top of the hill just watching him as he careened away. Was it Amy, just not wanting to let him go, or one of the others? He wished there was a way to tell. Everett turned his head back just in time to see the shopping cart on its side before him. He tugged right, but there wasn't enough time. His front tire caught the metal rungs and he flipped over, hitting the pavement hard. He groaned in pain, but immediately slid the rifle from his shoulder. He held it out before him and turned every which way. He couldn't see or hear anything. He looked up at the top of the hill he had come down and the wolf was gone. Everett threw the rifle back over his shoulder and grabbed the bicycle, ignoring the pain in his bones and the torn skin on his knee and shin from the fall. He hopped on it and looked forward. Then he cussed. There was a wolf standing in the road before him. It was enormous. Everett kept his eyes on the creature and slowly slid the rifle back off his shoulder. As he did, the wolf stood on its haunches and started to contort and change. Everett wanted to look away from the shifting bones and stretching flesh, but he knew it was too dangerous to let his guard down. Instead, 
he stared down the rifle sight at what ended up being his wife's naked form. He cussed loudly again and snapped. Let me go! Don't you see you're leading them right to me? If they eat me, it will be because of you. You will die without me, Everett. Please stop running, she said, stepping forward. Everett pulled the bolt on the rifle and pointed it at her, forcing her to stop. I'm going to die because of you, he snarled. You want to save me? Lead them away. Take your friends in a different direction. Let me go. Amy frowned. She eyed the gun and chanced to step forward anyway. Everett jammed it at her. Don't make me, he said, and she stopped moving. Her frown deepened. If I let you go, you die for sure, Everett. It hasn't gotten you yet, but the sickness will come for you eventually. I have the cure. You don't even have to be with me if you don't want to. I just want you to live. The quiet night was disrupted by a bellowing howl in the distance. Everett twitched, his hands tensed on the rifle. You don't just want me to live. You want me to live by your rules, to live as a monster. I won't. Now get out of the way and stop following me. Please don't do this, Everett. Move. It's not too late. Move. Amy sighed and stepped to the side. Everett threw the rifle over his shoulder and pedaled the bike by her. As he did, he could hear her bones snapping, and he grit his teeth and pedaled harder. He pushed his body to its limits and rode throughout the night. He didn't see Amy again, but he didn't believe that she was gone either. She wasn't going to give up. It was infuriating. When he couldn't take any more and he had to stop, he hopped off the bike and walked it to the side of a tall yellow house surrounded by thick oaks. He hid the bicycle in the shadow beside a bush, not that there was anyone left to steal it from him, but he didn't believe there was such a thing as too safe. Not anymore. He didn't go in the house. If the wolves came and found the bicycle, that would be the first place they would look. He couldn't hide out in the open. If he did, they would catch his scent and drag him out while he slept. He would become a meal before he even understood what was happening. Everett walked three houses up and turned at the corner, going down the side street a couple of houses. Then he looked over his shoulder. He paused, held his breath, and listened. No pause, no howls. Satisfied, he went around to the back of the house. The back door was locked, but there was a window that was open a crack. He forced it open enough to slip in head first. When he collided with the tiled kitchen floor, he immediately stood and closed the window, locking it. Then he took the house room by room looking for threats, assessing the situation. He wished he could turn the lights on, but that would be a beacon to the wolves, so he continued on one room at a time until he was sure that no one or no thing was hiding in wait for him. The house was full of long past rotten food and some animal was stashing its kills in the corner of the pantry. It smelled terrible, but Everett didn't clean it. He hoped the odor would mask his own scent and throw off the wolves if they came looking. He just wanted to stay the night, to rest, and then get on the move again at first light. He went upstairs where the rot wasn't as strong and found a skeleton in one of the beds. There wasn't much left of whoever they had been, but he was sure the sickness that had taken them was probably lingering, so he went to the bathroom and laid in the tub. He closed the curtain just in case, and before long he was asleep. Everett dreamed of a time when things were much different. He saw himself in a fine tailored suit, burgundy, dancing with Amy who looked exquisite in a ball gown. They were smiling at each other, thinking this was going to be their world forever, totally unaware of what was coming. It was his brother's wedding, his brother who was long gone now, resting in peace with his bride and their daughter. At least he hoped they were at peace. The living world certainly wasn't. When he awoke, the sun was bright enough to blind him even through the shower curtain that extended past the side of the tub. Everett groaned. He stood, but it took him a moment. His back screamed at him. His legs were still sore from all the pedaling, and his neck was stiff from sleeping in the hard bathtub. He stretched and rubbed at his face. Everett tried the sink and sighed with relief when water came out of the faucet. He used his hands as a cup and splashed it over his face. Then he drank several handfuls. He opened his backpack and got out his toothbrush and toothpaste. A dental infection could be a death sentence now, so he did his best to take care of them. When he was done, he sat at the top of the stairs and looked at his list. 
He didn't know how much longer he could avoid the wolves and their gigantic canines, so he figured he should try to cross something off of it if he could. The end could come for him any day, any moment. He perused the paper and crossed something off he had done the other day. Then he searched for something he could do now, something reasonable. He wasn't even sure what town or city he was in. He couldn't very well plan to see a tourist attraction. Everett smiled when he saw Ice Cream Shop. He wanted to go behind the counter like he worked there and make himself some ice cream. He could probably do that if the freezer still had power and the ice cream wasn't liquid. What was the worst that could happen? It would make him sick? He laughed to himself. Then he nodded, folded the paper, and put it away. He was going to ride a few towns over to put some more distance between him and the pack, and then he was going to find an ice cream shop. He enjoyed having a plan. It helped him to survive the chaos of the current world if he had an agenda. He wished he could develop a routine, some level of normalcy, but there was no way he could, not with Amy out there looking for him. He got his backpack and his guns and headed out, wanting to move quickly. Everett doubled back to where he stashed his bike, and it wasn't there. He sighed and cussed under his breath. Had another human found it, or was it one of the wolves? He hoped someone used it to get away, to survive, and it wasn't just trash to keep him around for dinner. Everett kicked the nearby tree and headed off on foot. He jogged as long as he could and walked when he ran out of breath or his muscles burned and begged for a break. He only stopped to check some of the abandoned cars for supplies. He found a working flashlight, which was cool, because his old one had been out of batteries for some time now. There was an unopened bag of chips, too, stale as all get-out, but edible. If only they had come with a drink. Everett traveled all day. He hated stopping, knowing that the wolves were on his tail. He wanted to go as far as his body would let him. Just the same, being out at night, especially on foot, sent his nerves haywire. There were too many shadows, too many obstacles. He felt like prey, and he hated it. Once the darkness fell over the road like a blanket, he decided he had to find shelter again. Maybe tomorrow, he would find that ice cream shop. Everett climbed on top of a work van and surveyed the area. It was pretty open, and that drew a frown from him. At the top of the hill was a gas station. It was well lit, so that was a good sign. The area still had power, or maybe the gas station had a backup generator that hadn't burned out yet. He wouldn't know until he got there. Maybe he could see more from there and find a safe place to hide out until sunrise. He hadn't seen or heard any sign of the wolves all day. He didn't know if that was a good or bad thing. Time would tell, he was sure. Everett stayed low and hurried up the hill between the broken cars. He couldn't help but stop when he saw the horse carcass. It hadn't fallen to the sickness. It hadn't died when the world did. It was still warm, opened up like a Ziploc bag, its contents removed completely. Its eyes were frozen wild with fear. Suddenly, the quiet of the night really bothered him. He hadn't heard the wolves because they were hunting. Hopefully, the horse filled their bellies for the time being. Everett needed to hide somewhere, and fast. He stood from the horse, and his eyes danced over all the details of the nighttime street. He saw nothing but the broken relics of a dead world. He knew there was more out there, though. The wolves couldn't be far, or the horse wouldn't have still been warm. Everett grimaced and then hurried up towards the gas station. He reached the front door and paused to look over his shoulder. He could swear he could hear the soft footfalls of graceful paws, but if he did, his eyes couldn't show him where. With a deep breath, he yanked the door open and went in. A bell jingled when he entered and he cringed, drawing in on himself. Instinctively, his hand went to the rifle on his shoulder. He slipped it off and held it, prepared to use it if he had to. He took a few steps in and that's when he saw the bicycle. His bicycle. It was at the back of the middle aisle, upside down, rear wheels spinning. Everett tensed. He held tightly to the rifle and approached, slowly. He was holding his breath. When he got to the bicycle, he saw a man lying next to it. He looked a lot like the horse, cracked open like a lobster dinner. There was a snarling wolf the size of a man hungrily gnawing at the inside of him and another tearing into the meat of his thigh, shaking its head side to side in order to rip the meat from the bone. Everett aimed the rifle and silently prayed they wouldn't notice him. Then an enormous paw struck the rifle's barrel, knocking it sideways out of his hands. He watched in horror as it flew across the back aisle, hit the floor, and slid across the tiles. Everett gasped. He looked over at the wolf that had disarmed him. 
It was standing on its hind legs like a human and staring over its bloody muzzle at him, looking directly into his eyes. Amy? He questioned. The lips pulled back in a snarl to show the yellow, razor-sharp teeth in full. Everett dove forward and hit the ground with a shoulder roll. He glanced back and saw the wolf still standing there, staring his way and growling at him. His eyes found the others, eating the man who had stolen his bicycle. They glanced up from their meal to make eye contact with him, but then returned to their food, chewing and slurping loudly, snorting as they breathed from their noses so they could keep eating. Everett scrambled to his feet. He ran for the counter. The wolf that had knocked away his rifle stepped over the dead man's legs and walked after him. It didn't drop back to all fours. It continued on like it thought it was human. It wasn't. Not anymore. Everett reached in his jacket and found the 45. He pulled it free as he rounded the counter. Behind the counter was another body, this one wearing a gas station uniform. Everett wondered if the woman had stolen the clothes to have a clean outfit or if she had actually continued showing up to work long after the end of the world. Maybe she just didn't know what else to do. He would understand if that was the case. Everett supposed it didn't matter now. She was nothing but an empty shell, her ripped throat dragged across the floor. Everett noticed the keys in her hand and his eyes roamed until they located the office door. It wasn't far. He glanced back at the wolf that had been following him and it was gone. Where the hell did it go? The 45 in one hand he grabbed at the key with his other. The woman's dead hand held them firmly. Everett gritted his teeth and tugged harder, but he couldn't get them free. He looked over his shoulder and saw that the other wolves had finished with their meal and they were stalking his way, low to the ground and creeping silently. Everett cussed. He went from holding his breath to breathing rapidly in a panic. He tugged at the keys to no avail. Then he shoved the 45 in the direction of the skulking wolves and pulled the trigger twice. The boom jerked his arm and sent pain lancing through his shoulder, but it was enough to make the wolves jump away and dart across the store to find safety. It was the last thing he wanted to do, but Everett knew he needed to use two hands to pry the keys from the rigor mortis of the dead girl. He shoved the 45 back into his jacket and, ignoring the pain in his shoulder, gripped the key ring with both hands. He pulled with all his might and heard snarling behind him. His heart raced and his breath quickened, but he didn't look back. He couldn't. Everett pulled at the keys. Behind him, he could hear the clack of long loop and nails slapping tiles. Then the keys came free and he bolted forward. Only when he reached the door did he look back. The wolf had its front low and its back high, like it was prepared to leap. It was snarling ferociously, spittle hanging like threads from its black gums. Everett twisted the first key in the knob and it turned. Luck was on his side again. He looked over and saw the wolf leap. Then he shoved his body into the door and it opened inward. He fell through just as he saw the giant wolf land where he had just been standing. Everett slammed the door shut and the wolf banged against the other side. Everett reached up and twisted the lock. Then he scrambled backwards on all fours until his back hit an obstacle and stopped him. He pulled the 45 back out of his pocket and pointed it at the door. Then things went quiet. Everett remained there listening and waiting. He was breathing hard. His fingers moved over the gun and adjusted and readjusted, itching to pull the trigger. Still, the silence remained. He couldn't stand it anymore and he got to his feet. Slowly, Everett approached the door. He looked through the small window in its center and saw the remains of the bodies being dragged away by the muzzles of the wolves. A moment later, he heard the bell of the front door. Everett supposed it was time to feed the rest of the pack. He thought of Amy feeding on these people's organs, tearing at their flesh and his stomach twisted in knots. He wanted to vomit. Instead, he turned from the door and worked to find the light switch. Everett took in the room for the first time and saw that the dead woman had been living here. There was a sleeping bag and a pillow, food remnants, and piles of uniforms. Everett sighed. He didn't like being locked in there with the wolves knowing it, but he didn't see any better options. It was late and dark, and leaving would be a death sentence for sure. On the other hand, he had no idea if the dead woman had been sick, and the idea of being in a tiny room with all her personal belongings didn't sit well with him either. Of course, he reminded himself that if it came between the wolves and the sickness, he had already made his choice. Sighing, Everett made himself comfortable on the sleeping bag. He kept his eyes on the door and his hand on the gun. He sat and watched and listened for what felt like forever, but he knew there was no way he could sleep. Not this night. 
When his stomach yelled at him, he dug through his backpack and frowned at how little he had left. He dug through the dead woman's food stores and found an unopened can of processed spaghetti rings. He yanked off the pull tab top and dug into it with his fingers, shoveling it into his mouth. He closed his eyes and moaned with delight, laughing in between bites at how good something so bad could be in the right moment. It's the little things, he thought. Satisfied and feeling like the wolves might be satisfied with their own meal enough to leave him alone for the night, Everett laid down. He still kept his eyes on the door and his hand on the 45. Then he was dreaming about his ice cream shop, except in his dream, the world was alive and he was smiling and mixing ice cream on a marble countertop for happily cheering children. There was lights and music. It was a different world, a happy world. When Everett awoke, he was still smiling. He wondered if the world would ever be like that again. Would it fix itself and start over anew, or was it really just over forever? He knew he wouldn't live long enough to find out the answer, and his smile fell away. That's when he noticed that the door was open. Everett felt a surge of panic. He gasped and scrambled into a sitting position. When he moved, he felt a twinge of sharp pain in his shoulder. He reached over and touched it, and he could feel the wound. What had happened? He drew his hand back and looked at the blood on his fingers. His eyes nervously scanned the darkness. Who's there? Where are you? He shouted into the void. Everett could hear the sounds of snapping bones behind him. He gasped and lunged forward, spinning around. When he righted himself, Amy was there, looking at him with sadness in her gaze. Even in her human form, blood still lined her lips and chin. What did you do? Everett asked quietly then again with more power to his voice. What did you do? I'm sorry, she said, and she sounded like she meant it. She frowned. I had no choice. They weren't going to wait any longer. Everett, they are coming for you, so I had to come first. There was no other way. Please forgive me. I'm sorry, but I couldn't let you die. I just couldn't. Everett slowly shook his head. It wasn't your choice to make, he said. You made your choice, and I made mine. Why couldn't you just respect that? Because I love you. What was I supposed to do? Why are you so damned stubborn? I had a chance to save you. I had to take it. Everett was breathing hard, trembling. He could already feel the effect of her bite. Time was running out. He would be a monster soon. He swallowed hard and raised the forty-five. Now I have to save myself. He said, putting the gun to the side of his head and pressing it to his temple. No, Everett, don't, Amy commanded. Then he squeezed his eyes shut and pulled the trigger. There was a dull click, no blast. He was still there, still alive. His arm fell to the floor at his side, still holding the empty gun. Everett coughed and he couldn't help but laugh. He finally got it, and it wouldn't matter in a moment once he was fully looping. He looked down at the gun and tears filled his eyes. I'm so sorry, Amy said to him. I know you. I knew you would. I took them first. I had to. Everett looked up and met her eyes then. He glared through the wetness and growled. You didn't have to, he said angrily. Then he felt his bones start to break and he screamed. I found your list, she said to him soothingly. You can do all those things now. We can do them together. Everett screamed again. Then his scream changed into a howl. I understand that this story is going to need a little context. That's fine, really, but... I have to apologize, because some of this is probably going to be incoherent, and I'll start sounding like I'm a rambling idiot. Maybe I am. I don't know. But I know what I saw. Something awful. Nightmarish. And I don't know how to handle it except to retell the story to you. Here's what happened. I'm a good kid. I don't skip classes, I don't cheat. I work hard to get good grades as best as I can. But things went south for me near midterms, 
when I started dating Dawn, my girl a year younger than me. It wasn't her fault, of course. It was because I wasn't very good at time management. I was spending evenings with her instead of studying like I was supposed to. My grades started to slip, and so did my conduct, for other reasons. She had an ex named Troy that was a jock from the football team, and probably about as smart as a bag of bricks. But man, could he punch. And he was intensely jealous that I was now dating Dawn. At first, I tried to ignore it, just let things ride out. But Troy wasn't having it. He wanted to beat me to a pulp, and I guess his Neanderthal brain thought that would win her back. I think we fought a few times, I'm honestly not sure. At first, my parents were on my side, and they complained to the school about Troy. But school politics is kind of tricky, and I soon found out Troy had a scholarship writing on his football career. This would make the whole school look good for him to go national. So, the chances of them plucking their golden goose due to a little roughhousing were slim. I was the one being punished. And to my surprise, my parents turned on me and told me that I needed to settle down and focus on my schooling. In fact, to make things worse, my dad warned me. If I couldn't get the situation under control, he was going to take away my car. It's gonna put me in a rough spot, so I'm sure you can imagine how shot my nerves were during the week of progress reports. I was nervous that I did something I will regret forever. It started of all places at the library when I was stressing alongside two friends. My buddy Carlos was yammering away about how he and his cousin Julio were going to break into the principal's office and hack the data to change their report before it was sent out. Julio's a master at this stuff, but he can't do it wirelessly. Firewall here is too strong. Carlos explained. Does he really think it can be changed? He, my best friend sitting next to me, asked. Oh yeah. That's why he got transferred to this campus. His old school was so mad they expelled him. I gave Carlos a skeptical look. That doesn't sound like a success. Well, his parents thought that the grades were all good when he transferred. They thought the expelling was for some other shit that went down. They were so mad at the school they didn't even bother to meet. Carlos said with a shrug. Something was fishy about the story, but I was still interested. Especially if the tale of getting the grades changed was even remotely true. I knew that several of my classes were below average, and I had been dreading my report card for weeks now. The hope to actually beat that, and my parents never knowing, was very tempting. When are you gonna do it? Pete asked. Carlos looked around the library conspicuously, as if we were being monitored, and whispered his answer. Come to my place tonight, we can hash out the details. I'm sure you can guess what was on my mind for the rest of the school day. I was going back and forth, trying to decide if I helped with the outrageous plan. I kept telling myself something was bound to go wrong, but then I reminded myself of my father's threats, and I knew they weren't empty. A lot was riding on the grades I got this semester. Troy was actually the one to convince me. Don and I were seeing each other one last time at the last bell. I feel guilty. A lot of this is because of me. I'm sorry. I've been a bad girlfriend, she said. No, don't say that. I think I just haven't figured out how to manage relationships in school properly. That's all, I told her. Then Troy came around the corner with his posse and pushed me against the wall. Figures! A loser like you wouldn't be able to handle her, he taunted. Don was telling him to stop, but I'm sure when he saw that I was still standing, his testosterone took over and he started throwing fists. A small ring of students surrounded us, and of all people, to stop the fight, it was actually Mr. Ronnie, the school janitor. 
I had never paid attention to him or his crew before this, but when he told Troy to get off of me, the hulky linebacker obeyed. I thanked him for that, and Ronnie nodded and told me to get home to clean my wounds. I knew, though, if it had been any of the actual teachers, it would have been like signing my death warrant. So after dinner, I convinced my mom and dad to let me run over to Pete's to study for the night, and they didn't even bat an eye. I knew why. Like I said, I'm a good kid, so the thought of me going to do something illegal wasn't even on their mind. Pete was actually a little more nervous than me. I've never even been to the campus after hours. Isn't it heavily monitored? He asked. Nah, man. All of the cameras are shut off after hours. Only the custodians are lurking about. But I don't think we need to worry about them. Carlos told us once he arrived. Julio explained that he had scoped out the campus and found a tear in the fence near the agricultural greenhouse on the east side. That'll be our entry point. Then we stick together and cross to the main building, Carlos said. He had a diagram of the campus map from a little brochure we got as freshmen, and explained. The easiest way to get in the principal's office is crossing over on the second floor. My uncle, Raul, works as a janitor, and I have been around him long enough that I know they start on the first floor. So if we take that route, we shouldn't run into any of them. Then we slip in, change the records, and get out. I bet we won't be in there longer than an hour. He concluded as he checked his watch. So, any questions? The plan seemed like it was foolproof, but I asked anyway. And if we do get caught? Run like hell, man, and deny we were ever there. Carlo said with a laugh. I was surprised he was acting so chill, given what we were about to do. But his attitude was definitely infectious. I felt that I could take on the world. Just to pump us up a bit, we drank a few beers, and then drove toward the housing area right behind the high school, crossing through a small grove of woods that led to the tear Julio knew about. I stopped to take a piss in the grove and couldn't help but to notice small little piles of bones scattered all throughout the area. Do we have coyotes around here? I asked as I zipped up my fly. This whole area used to be forested until they built the school. Last year, I heard a girl say there was a wild boar in the football field, Carlos told us. You sure that wasn't Troy? Pete laughed. I smiled and chuckled nervously, too focused on the bones to be comfortable. Some animal, or a small group of them, used these woods for a hunting ground, it seemed, and it occurred to me we were trespassing in their territory found it. I heard Julio announce near the front. It was already starting to get dark, and between the clouds, the only light we got was from a full moon. The terror was just where he said it was, and so like thieves in the night, we managed to crawl inside and into the greenhouse without even making the automatic lights flicker on. Once we made it to the parking lot, I saw a few shadows roaming near the theater hall and whispered. I thought you said they would be inside. Julio motioned for me to be quiet, and Carlos muttered. It's too dark for them to know who we are. Act normal, and let's go this way. We slid behind the building and found one of the emergency exits into the drama hall. Once inside, I took a moment to catch my breath. My heart was pounding. Pete looked pale. It was obviously making him second guess even being here. But we all knew it was too late to go back now. Keep it together. We are halfway there. Julio reminded us as we crossed the dark room. As we pressed onward, I kept looking over my shoulder, thinking one of the custodians would see us. The school was so empty and quiet, and we could even hear sounds from the nearby woods including the occasional coyote howl. Julio led the way up the stairs quietly, and then once we were at the second floor, he ran across the empty halls. Carlos, Pete, and I actually had to hurry to catch up. 
I told you this would be a piece of cake, Julio said excitedly as we got to the other stairs that led toward the cafeteria. Just as we were about to go down, I heard the sound of soft classical music and a frozen place. Julio and Carlos saw what I did mimicked as we watched Mr. Ronnie walking toward the cafeteria. He hadn't seen us yet. He paused to check his watch and then looked out toward the empty dark sky before slipping into the cafeteria. Come on, they're almost home free, Carlos said, pointing down the hall. We turned to the corner at the next hall to head for the main office and then, our hopes for this being a clean run shattered. One of the janitors was standing right there, staring at us. Shit! He said aloud as we all stood there for a moment, trying to decide what to do. Carlos chuckled nervously. Hey, you know Raul, right? He let us come work for the night and- Shut up and follow me now, the man said, pointing toward the cafeteria. He seemed worried about something, but I wasn't sure what. Did he think we had weapons or we might hurt him? Once inside the cafeteria, he checked his watch and muttered. Just stay here. Can you do that? All of us were so baffled by his behavior and honestly didn't have a clue what to do. The janitor stumbled off toward the back part of the cafeteria and I turned to Carlos and Julio for ideas. Do you think he's calling the cops on us? I asked. Doesn't matter. We're dead. Our parents are going to freak out. Pete mumbled. Maybe we should just leave, Carlos suggested. Then we heard this loud banging noise from the back room, and I jumped a bit. What was that? Pete shouted. I don't know. It sounded like someone got hurt, Julio said as we all instinctively walked toward the back. Hey, hey, Mr. Ronnie, are you back here? We were walking into the kitchen when we heard the noise again, this time clearer and coming from a nearby walk-in freezer. But the door was sealed tight. Oh shit, you think someone is stuck in there? Carlos asked. Hold on a tick, where'd that other guy go? Something ain't right about this, Julio said, but I was already at the door and opening it, trying to see what the banging noise was. When I opened the door, I don't know what I was expecting to see, but what I got was the shock of my life. There were two large bipedal wolves in the freezer, both at least 10 feet tall, biting and clawing at one another in a mad frenzy. Both of them had muscles rippling throughout their body, and both were tearing at each other like complete savage predators. I was so stunned by the sight that I froze for a moment. And that was all it took for the first wolf to push his opponent straight toward me. The force of the second wolf hitting me knocked me backward and I hit something sharp as I fell. Then I looked up and saw knives just barely dangling from a magnetic strip. I reacted this time in a heartbeat and crawled away as the cutlery came crashing down, stabbing into the large wolf as I heard it shriek in pain. As I scrambled to get back on my feet and stand by my friends, the wolf that had won the fight stepped out of the freezer. Now at its full height, I could see that it was at least 14 to 15 feet tall standing up, and its eyes glowed paler than the moon itself. The wolf went over and snapped the neck of the second wolf, howling in triumph before glaring at us. Its massive fangs were dripping with saliva and blood. Holy shit, Pete said. I think that summed up our situation nicely. But to our surprise, the wolf didn't attack. Instead of focusing on the kill and eating it, we used the opportunity to run back to the main cafeteria. We didn't stop running until we got out of there and toward the main office, catching our breath at the nurse's station. Before long, though, we heard the sound of the creature as it began to move about the halls, tracking us. This can't be fucking real. The janitors are fucking werewolves? This is like goosebump shit, Carlos said frantically. Hey, puta, keep your voice down or that thing will hear us, Julio said as he glanced over the desk just a tad 
to see where the wolf was. I think it went the other way, he said, catching another breath. Good, so should we. I'm getting out of here, Pete declared. Wait, what about the report cards? Julio asked. My best friend shook his head and said, You're kidding, right? We just saw the freakiest shit in our lives and you're still worried about that damn grade. Pete, we've come this far. Carlos agreed. Pete shook his head dismissively. No, man, ain't worth it. What about you? He asked as he looked toward me. I was still trying to get my heart to calm down but I didn't like the idea of splitting up. We have a better chance of getting out of here if we stay together, I told Pete, but he didn't want to hear it, so he just walked away. I almost followed him when Julio led the way to the main principal's office and I focused on the reason we were here. Slipping into the office, Julio activated the internet and started to test different passwords as Carlos and I kept watch. Every few minutes we could hear the gentle sound of steps, except we weren't sure if they were human or not. This is so damn fucked up. How many of the staff you think have changed? Carlos asked. I don't know, but I get the feeling they aren't trying to hurt anyone. Well, not intentionally anyway, I said. And what makes you think that, Sherlock? He scoffed. Mr. Ronnie must have locked himself in the freezer on purpose when he knew he was about to change, and I bet the other guy we met panicked and went there as well. We probably interrupted him from heading to whatever his designated spot was. I told him. Does that mean they won't hurt us now? Carlos asked. No, now that they're on the prowl, or at least one of them is. We have to stay alert. Hey, hey you guys, I think I got it to work. Julio shouted excitedly. We turned toward him to see the progress he made. And at the same time, a massive dark furry form jumped through the wall from behind Julio. The giant wolf's claws hit him straight in the back and it almost seemed like what happened next was occurring in slow motion. Julio's forehead smashed into the computer and the entire principal's desk came sliding towards Carlos and I pinning us to the window. The wolf pulled Julio out of the computer screen and tossed him like a rag doll. We heard his bones break, and then his spine shatter as the wolf clawed at his back. The giant creature tore into his intestines like they were spaghetti. Frantically, Carlos and I pulled ourselves to the doors, pushing it open and then starting a blind run down the hall. Carlos was a little faster than me and led the way into one of the classrooms, slamming the door shut and telling me to bunker down. Both of us remained silent as we heard the werewolf howl out, and then it got quiet again. I think we need to stay here for now. Give me that desk, Carlos said. We used one of the students' desks to ram against the door, and then collapsed on the carpet, trying to comprehend how we were supposed to get out of here alive. For the next ten minutes, neither of us said a word. I kept thinking I was hearing heavy breathing right outside the door, but honestly it could have been my frantic imagination. Carlos was occasionally peeking out the door, and once he was sure the coast was clear, he waved for me to follow him. Gingerly we snuck back toward the east side of the campus. The quiet halls freaked me out even more, now that I knew something was hunting us. We pushed through the main gymnasium where they had award ceremonies, and as we made it toward the other side, I froze, hearing something from behind the curtain. It sounded like a whimper of pain. I pushed the curtain back and held back a shout as I saw Pete laying there in a pool of his own blood covered in deep scratches across his abdomen and face. He was somehow still alive, but I didn't think it could be for very long. We have to leave him, Carlos told me. Pete's eyes fluttered open when he heard us talk, and he began to sputter and beg out for our help, his hands flailing to grab at my pants. 
Please, something is happening to me, he mumbled. I looked straight in his eyes, wishing I could help. Then I saw a bright pale ring of light glimmer around his irises. I pulled back, stumbling away from the curtain as he shouted for help. Then his shouts became incoherent as we heard bones break, and I turned to Carlos and told him to run. As I looked back one last time, I saw the curtain begin to fall, and Pete's mangled body was now distorting into the form of a giant wolf. Its eyes had caught sight of me just as we closed the door. Go! I shouted to Carlos as we ran down the hall. The wolf slammed the door open, pulling it off its hinges as it came through. Glass scattered across the tile floor as we both broke into a blind run, the newly formed monster right at our heels. We pushed out to the main campus grounds, the sprinklers going off across the grounds as we heard a louder howl, and I saw another wolf was standing in the bleachers. When it heard us push out through the exit, it started toward us as well. The younger wolf got in its path, and the two immediately took interest in one another, snapping their teeth at each other ferociously. Carlos grabbed me and pulled me into the boys' outdoor shower near the bleachers. We hunkered down and listened as the wolves once again battled it out. The young one didn't stand a chance, though. Perhaps because of Pete's own injuries, or because the other wolf had more experience. But the older creature grabbed at Pete's hind legs, and then tossed him against the wall, breaking the young creature's ribs. We knew that we could be next. On the count of three, we run toward the greenhouse. Carlos said as we heard the other wolf begin to rip meat out of its prey. I don't really know what we counted to. We ran like hell. Carlos was halfway across the field when he tripped on his own feet. The wolf was barreling down on us again. I turned back just in time to see his face get torn off. Then I fell on the grass, crawling backward and trying to find anything to defend myself with. The wolf was now slowly marching toward me, its gleaming eyes focused on my terrified, trembling body. It towered over me, the drool from its fangs falling down on my face. Its long dew claws scratched my arms as it pressed its heavy body down opening its jaws wide to fit my head into its mouth. Then a loud shot echoed across the football field and I heard the wolf whimper. Then another, and another. The massive creature fumbled backward and then fell to its side, heaving, gasping, whining. I saw a figure near the top of the bleachers, a man holding a rifle. As he got closer, I realized it was Mr. Ronnie himself. He aimed the rifle at the wolf one more time and blew its brains out, then turned the gun toward me. I won't tell anyone, I said, fumbling with my words. But you can't kill me too. Someone has to cover this up, right? He lowered the weapon slowly and I formed a crazy plan. You've got at least four dead bodies here on campus. I can help hide them. Then we can figure this out together. I'll keep your secret and you keep mine. Or I fill you with this silver, he said, gritting his teeth. But I could tell he was reconsidering. He knew I was right. This wasn't supposed to happen. You've trained your people to hide and lock themselves up. People got hurt. Can't hide that unless you have help. I can make this go away. For a few tense moments, he thought it over, and then agreed. Don't make me regret this, he warned. Over the next hour, I helped him drag their bodies into the woods. Our story was that coyotes attacked the kids. He burned the body of his co-worker and then told me to leave. 
The next day at school, we shared an unspoken nod as news spread about how wild coyotes had broken into school and tore up a bunch of equipment. The story was that some idiot teens had thought it would be a fun prank to let the animals roam campus, and their stupidity had gotten them in trouble. As it turned out, my parents were so paralyzed by the trauma of what happened to my friends, they didn't even pay attention to the report card when it arrived. And I kept my end of the bargain, and didn't tell anyone what I saw that night. Dawn tried to coax it out of me a few times, and I didn't even tell her. She was concerned when she saw the deep scars on my arms. That could be infected, she said. I had been wearing long sleeves most of the school days to not attract attention. I knew she was right, but I wasn't about to go to the doctor. This was a toxin that no hospital could treat. Every time she touched it, it burned, but I promised I was going to be okay. Then, just as she checked the wound again with the last bell, Troy appeared with his posse and pushed her away. What's it going to take for you to get the hint that you should have died with your friends? He asked as he grabbed my arm. The pain was intense, but the anger I felt was stronger. I pushed back and slammed him against the wall with strength I didn't know I had. Shit, what's wrong with your eyes? Troy asked. Him and his posse ran away after that. Even Dawn was scared by the rage that I had displayed. She claimed I looked possessed. I stumbled into the nearby restroom to splash water on my face and looked at my eyes. The pale ring of light behind my irises was starting to form. Behind me, I heard the restroom door close, and I saw Mr. Ronnie standing there. We both know I can't let you leave this restroom until it's over, he told me. This is where I have been locked up for the past three hours. My body is sweating profusely. I think it will happen very soon. I think Ronnie said he would return with Silver to finish me off and claim it was suicide by overdose. But I'm not sure. I think he was lying. I keep feeling the urge to crawl into a ball and just let it take over. Soon it will. And I think when it does, he's going to let me live. And that terrifies me even more. Henry Grayson heard a mournful howl of wind when he stopped to catch his breath. After a harrowing dash through the forest, he rested his head against an old oak's trunk for support. Looking up, bare limbs swayed in the cold fall gusts. Moisture-laden clouds raced northwest to southeast playing hide-and-seek with the moon. The on-and-off darkness obscured the landscape ahead. A sense of vertigo swept over him as he gasped for air and experienced the altering illumination. Far in the distance, he heard a low rumble. The first evidence of an approaching storm made itself known. His panic intensified. As the thunder grew louder, the cloud density could thicken and reduce the light from the moon. He would be trapped in this nightmare of a forest where directions seemed meaningless. A sudden rustle of leaves from behind spurred him to run again. Only the dimming light from the moon kept him from running headlong into one of the many trees spread out before him. A sudden clap of thunder settled into a low rumble as he struggled to catch his breath. Looking toward the sky, the lunar disk grew more obscure as a solid haze of cloud enclosed around it. 
Sounds of pursuers grew louder as he plunged ahead. His lungs felt on the verge of bursting. A fallen log tripped him. He fell face down in the thick carpet of leaves shed by their once gracious hosts. Panic engulfed him. He had to keep moving. When he tried to push himself up, a force pressed hard on his back, and his face once again encountered the damp loam on the forest floor. A stinging sensation burned between his shoulder blades, and the vertigo returned. The sounds of the storm faded as his world turned black. Grayson's eyes fluttered open. A strong scent of moist earth permeated his surroundings. Bound to the hard surface where he lay, his arms and legs were immobile. Enclosed by darkness, only a horizontal streak of light could be seen low to his left. The dim radiance failed to reveal any details of the space. A tear trickled down his temple after he blinked to clear an irritation in his eye. Metal on metal clattered above the thin slit of illumination. A door opened, revealing a shadow surrounded by a halo of brightness. Ah, Grayson, you're finally awake. No thanks to you. If memory serves, you're the one who decided to take an unauthorized stroll after dark. Did I not warn you about the folly of trekking through the forest at night? Grayson closed his eyes and remained quiet. You should thank me, where you fell as a lospa, subject to flash floods, particularly during storms like the one we experienced last night. I am so very fortunate. Yes, you are, but I should mention your sarcasm is not appreciated. A shearing pain shot through his lower extremities. He gritted his teeth and took a sharp breath. The silhouette figure said, Do I have your attention? Through a clenched jaw, he said, Yes. Good. Professor Grayson, the contract you signed with my laboratory specified your expertise in genetics would be at our disposal. You're currently in violation of that agreement. I didn't know you'd be conducting experiments on humans. The man sighed. Oh, Professor, you are so naive. How could we conduct authentic genetic manipulations if we didn't work on human volunteers? You never mentioned that. Grayson heard a chuckle emerge from the gloom. <laughs> My good doctor. Why would I want to use rats? There are plenty of wretched souls in the northern part of this island. Individuals, I might add, who do not enhance the human condition. Experimenting on people is unethical. Please spare me your moral platitudes. If we are to survive as a species, we will need to possess superior senses and intelligence over the coming millennia. Evolution is too slow for man to adapt to the rapid environmental changes we are experiencing. Therefore, it will be up to us to create our own enhancements. So you plan to be the one who provides these improvements by playing God? Playing God has nothing to do with it, Professor. Creating a superior human is the ultimate goal. Can you imagine what that wealthy individuals will spend to have a clone of themselves? One that will have enhanced intelligence and senses? It's all about the money, isn't it? Doctor, you are once again relying on flawed Judeo-Christian ethos. Attitudes from a time and place which no longer exist. In today's world, everything is about money and power. I might remind you, money buys power. No will not be part of your scheme. That's too bad. Another searing pain spread through his spine until Nobel Prize winning geneticist Henry Grayson, MD and PhD, succumbed to darkness. Galliano Island, located between Vancouver Island and the lower mainland of British Columbia, Canada, is available to mainlanders only by ferry, a long and narrow island. A majority of the land is covered in deciduous and evergreen trees. Access to various parts of the island is by modern paved roads, while other portions rely only on old logging trails. The laboratory, now occupied by Dr. Grayson against his will, resided in a less traveled, heavily wooded, privately owned track of land near the southern tip of the island. 
Self-contained with the utilization of solar panels and wind turbines, few individuals knew of its existence or significance. The owner of the land, Victor Du, protected his privacy and advocation with diligence and resolve. Watching the setting sun, he sat on his veranda warmed by a standalone brick fire pit. The deep purples and oranges on the horizon indicated another storm brewed to the west. After a sip of his single malt scotch imported from the mainland, he turned to his assistant in the chair next to him. I had hoped Dr. Grayson would be more open to our project, my dear. Victor, you need to vet these people better, or it will be the same each time you bring one of them into your confidence. Cheryl Ward sipped a glass of Savion Blanc. She looked at Victor. Your vision is far ahead of the current scientific thought. Most geneticists still look at your research as furthering the practice of eugenics. Nothing could be further from the truth. You and I both know that. However, many of your contemporaries have the perception your research will only benefit the elite. Do sip his scotch as dusk turned to night. In a sense, they are right. In the beginning, only those who can afford the procedure will benefit. But like most new ideas and inventions, the costs will decrease as the technology is improved. She sipped her wine and watched the distant flashes of lightning off in the western sky. Yes, my darling. And you will hold the patents on the technology. The next morning, Du observed the failed experiment through the one-way glass. The individual paced like a caged lion, even though it possessed few genetic sequences from the species Panthera leo. The creature resembled a wolf, but with numerous human characteristics. With the familiar long snout, the similarity ended there as it morphed into the rounded skull of a human female. Hunched over, the forearms were longer than the rear legs, which caused the creature to move with a gait similar to a lowland gorilla. The thick black fur covering the beast appeared to be a mix of a canine and chimpanzee. He folded his arms and spoke into a microphone next to a medical monitor showing the creature's heart and respiratory rates. Good morning, Heidi. The pacing stopped. She bared her fangs, glared at the window, and emitted a low growl. You know where I am, don't you? The snarl intensified. You have more innate intelligence than you are allowing us to see. The howl changed to a series of barks and wails. She charged the window but stopped just short of ramming it. The head lowered but the eyes stayed locked on Du, even though she could not see him. A low-pitched moan resonated through the speakers next to the medical monitor. Turning off the microphone, Du checked the monitor and saw an accelerated heart and respiratory rate. Good, your emotions are maturing and producing the proper physiological response. The door to the observation lab opened and a woman of small stature entered. Good morning, Dr. Du. Morning, Ms. Hines. What are your instructions this morning concerning Heidi's diet? Continue with the high-protein, low-carbohydrate combination for another week. We'll see if her cognitive responses continue to improve. I'm very pleased with her progress so far. Yes, doctor. The diminutive woman shut the door and left. He pulled a chair out from a desk and sat. With a touch on a keyboard, the computer monitor brightened and he retrieved his prior notes. He typed, Subject has exhibited heightened perception this AM and appears to sense my presence through the observation window. DNA analysis has determined the slicing we attempted did not manifest itself in the precise way we envisioned. However, the appearance of acute awareness by the subject is encouraging. The procedure may eventually be capable of producing the results originally hypothesized. He stopped typing and removed his glasses. Dr. Grayson's input into the process of splicing DNA had taken the project to this point. His refusal to assist further could only be described as catastrophic for the project. Standing, he went back to the observation window to see if Heidi would sense his presence. The creature lay curled up with its head down. As soon as Dew stood in front of the window, she raised her head 
stared in his direction, bared her fangs, and issued a low grumble. Hearing the sound, Dew checked to make sure all sounds were being recorded inside the creature's habitat. Very good, Heidi. Henry Grayson, Emeritus Professor of Evolutionary Genetics at Stanford University, stared at the ceiling. His absence and lack of communication with former colleagues would not create any warning signs. Habitually a loner, he never married and lived alone for decades. He rarely saw his housekeeper since she came late mornings once a week and he had given her notice he would be out of town for the foreseeable future. Remorse consumed him at having taken the position Dr. Dew offered without making proper inquiries. The project and the man's intentions weighed heavy on his mind. Released from the metal table in the laboratory and escorted back to his dorm room, Grayson speculated how much longer he would be allowed to live. He possessed little hope of ever being released to spread the word about all the horrendous experiments being conducted at this facility. He lay in his bed with his hands behind his head, staring at the ceiling when he heard a knock on his door. He ignored it. The knocking persisted, but at a higher volume. Finally, he rose and went to the door. Yes. Professor Grayson is Victor Du. I would like to discuss a proposal. What kind of a proposal? May I come in? You obviously have a key. Use it. I would prefer you voluntarily let me in. Very well. He unlocked the door and let it swing open as he stepped back into the room. Dew stood there, a slight grin on his face as he stepped in. Thank you, Professor. What do you want? Your continued cooperation with our project. We had this discussion the other night. I will not take part in unethical or illegal experiments. Even if the one we conducted has proven to be successful? Grayson studied Dew silently for several moments. What do you mean successful? Your work has produced a sentient being. The geneticist from Stanford remained quiet as he determined whether to believe this man he distrusted. He turned his back and walked to his bed. Did you hear me, Professor Grayson? Yes, I heard you. The last time I saw the creature, it did not appear aware of its surroundings. That is a far cry from being sentient. Heidi's awareness and cognitive abilities grow exponentially with each day. Grayson sat on the unmade bunk and studied the floor. Does it have the ability to voice sounds other than grunts? Yes. Looking up, the professor said, I don't believe you. Dew held up a small device and pressed a button. The sound emitted from the small recorder resembled a growl, but Grayson distinctly heard the words, let me out. The creature paced in the small room, turning to the observation window on every other pass. Grayson said, She is only looking at her image as she passes the mirror. She is not aware we are here. As he finished speaking, the creature charged the glass and stopped just before reaching it. The words he heard on the recording were repeated. Let me out the voice low and rumbling. You see, Dr. Grayson, she hears you even though our microphones are off. She senses our presence in the room. Fascinating. Are you now ready to help again? Grayson remained quiet as he followed Heidi's movements. Have you let her outside yet? No, we do not know her strength. The professor turned to do. You haven't let her out of the cage? No, all of this development has occurred in the past three days, with the only interaction being with her dietitian and myself, all through remote access. No personnel contact. Fascinating. He stayed near the window and kept his gaze on the creature as it paced in the room again. Must find an open space for her to roam or she will be safe. Professor, that is the first time you have referred to it by gender. I beg your pardon? You have always referred to Heidi as it, or the creature, never as a female. Grayson turned to do. What did I call it? You said her and she. The professor glanced back at the creature who now lay on the floor of the cage like a content puppy dog. 
head up and concentrating on the window from which they observed her. He said, You mentioned a DNA analysis earlier. May I see it? Dew handed the professor a manila folder. Man accepted the file without a word and studied the contents. Five minutes later, he closed it and handed it back to Dew. I see where I made my mistake. Three months later, Henry Grayson no longer felt the compulsion to dispute the ethics of the experiments he conducted. Curiosity replaced indignation, driving him to work 20-hour days, stopping only briefly for a snack or a three- or four-hour nap. His concentration stayed on target day after day without diminishing returns. Victor Dew no longer kept track of him, instead letting the professor follow his pursuits without supervision. On the third day of the third week in the third month of Grayson's renewed enthusiasm, he summoned Victor Dew to meet him in the laboratory at precisely noon. Yes, Professor. Ah, Dew, you're here. I need you to build an outdoor encampment. Folding his arms, the complex's owner asked, Why? If you will remember, when we allowed Heidi to be in a larger space, her progression with perception and language grew exponentially. Yes. She allowed others to get in close proximity to her. Unfortunately, she lacked a gene sequence essential for the development of her immune system. She died of a common cold. I am very much aware of this, Professor. So why do we need an outdoor area for our subject? To allow them to be exposed to naturally occurring viruses and bacteria. Otherwise, we will constantly repeat what we created with Heidi. Very well. I will have one constructed. Thank you. Late Winter The fruits of Grayson's efforts were two beings, one female and one male. Both resembled the physical appearance of Heidi, but with specific changes in their DNA sequencing. The professor's observation of the two subjects occurred from a camouflage deck high above the newly built and enclosed habitat. For lack of a better way to identify them, the professor dubbed them Adam and Eve. Neither showed any aggression toward their human caregivers. From the observations and interaction between them and Grayson, he hypothesized their intelligence to be greater than Heidi's. However, neither had uttered any coherent words so far, mostly grunts and clicks. During an early morning scheduled observation, Victor Dew joined Grayson. How are your creations doing this morning, Professor? I am developing a note of concern about them. While their perception and reasoning skills are far superior to Heidi's, they have yet to develop language. Language you understand, or are they non-communicative? Grayson glanced at Dew for a second before returning his gaze on the scene below their location. Interesting question, Dr. Dew. However, I am a geneticist, not a linguist. Someone with a different skill set would need to determine the answer. I obtained the services of Cheryl Ward before I started this endeavor. She is a linguistic anthropologist and would be more than happy to assist your assessment of Adam and Eve. With a raised eyebrow, Grayson nodded. I believe that would be appropriate. Two weeks later, the meeting occurred in the office of Cheryl Ward. Adam and Eve have a system of communicating which is highly complex, Dr. Grayson. Explain, Ms. Ward. What we hear as clicks, grunts, and growls are very specific sounds forming a vocabulary only they apparently understand. I have been able to deduce the meaning of some combinations, but not enough to be able to communicate with them. That will take months. Dew asked, Professor Grayson, could there be a mutation in the genetic sequence which dictates the development of vocal cords? Possibly. I am most intrigued by how rapidly they developed a distinct language. Cheryl Ward nodded. I too would like to know how they did it. In most human cultures, language is learned. Vocabulary evolves within a group and is passed from one generation to the next. This development between them is most intriguing. An extremely loud alarm bell sounded. At the exact same moment, Victor Dew's cell phone pinged. Accepting the call, Dew listened as a frown grew on his face. He thanked the caller and said, 
No one knows how they did it, but Adam and Eve are no longer in the compound. They've escaped. Dreams, nightmares, hallucinations, and visions haunted Henry Grayson once again. He could not distinguish between them anymore. When he slept, the pictures continued to get worse. He could not get the image of the now-dead Heidi out of his mind's eye. Before her death, she had actually allowed him to place his hand on her head. Two days later, she took her last breath, ravaged by a virus a normal human easily fought off. Now with the disappearance of Adam and Eve, the consequences of his research began to penetrate his conscience once again. The search for the elusive creatures by members of Victor Dew's staff continued, but so far, no trace of them could be found. On the third day of the search, two staff members went missing. Victor Dew paced as he listened to Cheryl Ward. Doris Hines and Raymond Jones did not return from their assigned search area. Per your instructions, all search personnel are to be back before dark. That was an hour ago. They have yet to check in by radio. Where were they assigned? Southwest, to the shores of the Trincomalee Channel. Okay, arm our security personnel and send them in. If it becomes necessary, they are to protect themselves. I'll take care of it. Dew left his private study and took the elevator to the floor below and the location of Henry Grayson's room. He knocked on the door several times without a response. Finally, on the fourth series of rapping on the entrance, it opened. A disheveled Professor Grayson held the door open. Dark circles under his eyes betrayed his weariness. The normally clean-shaven geneticist bore a four-day-old beard. His appearance gave pause to do. Are you ill, Professor? No. Have they found Adam and Eve? The question answered Dew's concern. The geneticist's worry about the missing Adam and Eve were dominating his thoughts. No. Now we have two staff members missing as well. Where were they searching? Southwest. Concentrate your search efforts there. Folding his arms, Dew asked, Do you know something you have not informed us about? Grayson stared at Dew for several moments and then nodded. Should we consider Adam and Eve dangerous? Yes, extremely. Why didn't you mention this before, Professor? Because you would have ordered them euthanized. Crimson spread up Dew's cheeks. He clenched his teeth and glared at the professor. Grayson, if Hines and Jones are not found alive... He turned and hurried to inform the rest of his team. The next morning. At the first light of dawn, three jeeps exited the entrance to Victor Dew's compound. Each contained a driver and a passenger. Both were armed with AR-15s chambered with 5.56 NATO rounds. Instructions from Victor Dew to these individuals demanded if they caught sight of Adam or Eve, shoot to kill. The creature known as Adam observed this activity from the safety of dense underbrush which concealed his location. To him, the past did not matter. Surviving, getting to tomorrow, and protecting his mate did. His mate, Eve, lay hidden ten meters from where he crouched. Her scent had changed, creating an urgent need within him to protect her. Plentiful amounts of food presented themselves to the two creatures since escaping the confines of the building. Within the structure, trees existed, but underbrush did not. Adam preferred the underbrush, which offered opportunities to secure and capture sustenance. A new scent could be detected emanating from the building. The receptors in his snout caused an unease within him. An unease he did not understand until their encounter previous day with the two hairless beings. Fear. The inhabitants of the building feared him and Eve. Instinctively, he knew this to be a powerful weapon, a weapon he could use against those who wished to return he and Eve to the confines of the building. Greg Dubois, head of security for Victor Dew's company, stopped the jeep, turned to the man who held the AR-15, Remy Rousseau, and pointed. What does that look like over there? Rousseau studied the area Dubois indicated. Oh man, I hope it isn't what it looks like. Cover me, I'll check it out. The driver shifted the vehicle to park and reached for his rifle in the back seat. 
As Rousseau entered the underbrush, Dubois stood ready to protect if needed. Seconds ticked by as he neared the object he sought to examine. It's her, Greg. Get a tarp. After the remains of Doris Hines were covered, Dubois returned to the jeep and reported the discovery on the radio. This is Dubois. I need to speak to Victor. Two minutes later, he heard, What did you find, Greg? We found Doris. Silence came from the speaker. Finally, he heard, I take it she is deceased. Unfortunately, yes, sir. Without going into details, how did she die? Violently. I was afraid of that. The radio grew silent as Dubois waited for further instructions. I will send someone to collect the body. Don't leave her alone until they get there. Give me your location. After he understood where the two men were, Du asked, Any sign of Raymond Jones? Not yet, sir. Very well. Keep me posted. Originally trained as a medical doctor, Victor Du's curiosity about creating a superhuman led him away from his lucrative medical practice to the field of research. With the recovery of Doris Hines' small body, he would utilize his knowledge of physiology to try to determine how she died. When he uncovered her on the examination table, he knew immediately the cause of death. Putting the sheet back over the woman, he went to the intercom next to the laboratory door and pressed a button. Summon Professor Grayson to the lab immediately. A disconnected voice replied, Yes, sir. Ten minutes later, an ashen-faced Henry Grayson stared at the mutilated body of Doris Hines. Dew asked, Did you anticipate this, Professor? A slow shake of Grayson's head became the answer. He remained quiet for almost a minute. This is what results when we play God, Victor. You seem to forget that I'm an Eva of your making. Man is not smart enough to understand the delicate balance years of natural selection provide a species. Your obsession with speeding up the process has caused this catastrophe. He turned his attention away from the body and looked at Dew. I was a fool to let my excitement of discovery overcome my repugnance for this research. Grayson, I have never seen anyone vacillate so fast between euphoric enthusiasm and self-loathing as you have. In my opinion, you are mentally unstable, and I have no further need for your assistance. Your contract with this institution is terminated, effective immediately. Now, get off my land. Do turned and walked out of the laboratory, leaving Henry Grayson standing alone next to the partially consumed body of Doris Hines. The wide variety of sea life in the waters off the southern tip of Galliano Island and the northern shores of Maine Island provided a sanctuary of sorts for Harold Betchworth. Now in his early 80s and a widower, his meager pension earned from working four and a half decades as a longshoreman at the port of Vancouver barely sustained him. He sublimated his earnings by selling his daily catch to restaurants in the Richmond and Vancouver, British Columbia area. His small fishing boat trolled the waters 50 meters offshore of this unusually warm day in late August. With a successful morning behind him, he prepared to raise his nets one more time before heading for the mainland 20 kilometers to the northeast. After raising his starboard net with ease, he stored the catch in one of his many coolers and tossed ice on top. Efforts to raise his port net were not successful. He struggled with it for almost 10 minutes before it broke free and rose. The torn net hung empty as he stared at it. A noise to the stern caused him to turn and witness the emergence from the water of what he would later describe as a spawn of the devil. Henry Grayson boarded a ferry at the Sturdy's Bay Terminal for the ride to Sawasan, British Columbia Terminal. He originally arrived on Galliano Island via a car sent by Victor Dew. He did not receive the same courtesy for his journey back to the United States. After finding a secluded spot in the passenger lounge, he settled in for the ferry ride and to contemplate his future. Halfway across the channel, he overheard a conversation between two men laughing about the ravings of a senile old fisherman. When he heard the word wolfman spoken by one of the two, he paid closer attention to the discussion. 
Two minutes later, he stood and approached the two men. Excuse me, I couldn't help but overhear your conversation. Did you mention something about an old man transporting two wolfmen across the Strait of Georgia? The younger of the two men chuckled. Yeah, craziest story I ever heard. He's a local from Sasaswan who makes a few extra bucks selling fresh fish to a pub I go to. He told the owner about these two wolf creatures who came out of the sea and had him take them to an isolated spot on the U.S. mainland. Did they mention where? The man stared at Grayson for a few moments. Nah, I stopped listening after that. Could you tell me the name of the pub? Why, do you believe the old coot? Grayson shook his head and smiled. No, but I like pubs that serve fresh fish. Two hours later, he entered an establishment known as Rivera's Reef Tavern and sat at the bar. He ordered a fish and chips. After he finished his meal, he asked the bartender where he got his fish. Local guy goes out every morning and is back here by noon with his catch. I normally buy most of it. Why? It's hard to find good seafood where I'm from. Does he guide? Don't know. Never asked him. Know where he lives? I could check with him myself. No, sorry. But he'll be here in the morning a little after ten. You can ask him then. The next morning. Harold Betchworth tied his Everglades Center Console Bay boat to the dock alongside Rivera's Tavern. Henry Grayson stepped up and asked if he could assist. Betchworth raised an eyebrow. What for? I've got it. I understand you had two passengers the other day. The old man stopped what he was doing and stared at the stranger. Why would you care? So you can make fun of me too? No, because I know who they are and I need to find them. Betchworth looked hard at Grayson. Let me get my fish sword and then you can buy me a beer. An hour later, Betchworth wolfed down a sandwich purchased for him by Grayson. After he ate, he sipped on a beer and eyed his benefactor. You never told me your name. Henry Grayson. So, you say you know them? No, I said I know who they are and I need to find them. The old man shrugged. Don't know where they are. They jumped out of the boat about 20 meters from shore and swam the rest of the way. Last I saw them, they were running toward a wooded area north of Neptune Beach. How did they communicate with you? That's the weird thing. They didn't. The male pointed toward the east and I understood what he meant. I'm sorry, he did what? I said the male pointed his finger and I knew where he wanted me to take them. They didn't say anything? Betchworth shook his head. Not a word. I did hear the female growl once, but she was rubbing her tummy. Grayson hesitated to ask his next question. Was there something wrong with her? She was pregnant. They told you? Nope. I just knew. Kind of like voices in my head, but not. Know what I mean? Henry Grayson wanted to ask more questions, but the revelation from the elderly man caused his head to swim. Finally, he said, Let me get this straight. You heard voices in your head? Not voices. Jeez, people would really think I was crazy if I said anything like that. I just knew what they needed, and that's what I did. He took a sip of beer. Did you feed them, Mr. Betchworth? I didn't have to. They helped themselves to some of the fish I'd caught that day. Ate it raw, heads, skills, and all. Thought you said you knew them. Why are you asking all these questions? I need to find them. Good luck with that. The male acted like he didn't want to be found, but I think I know where they are headed. Where? There's an Indian nation not far from where they entered the woods. It's called the Lummi Reservation. Go on. It was more of a feeling than having someone tell me, you know? No, I'm afraid I don't. Grayson stood. Feel lucky you survived your encounter with these two. You are the first human to have contact with them and remain alive. He turned and walked out of the pub. As he went through the door, he heard Betchworth say, What do you mean, first human? 
The rest of the question could not be heard due to the crashing of waves on the dock. Grayson obtained a map of the Northwest Washington State region and located the Lummi Reservation. After numerous phone calls and transfers to individuals who could not help him, he reached a tribal elder. He made an appointment for the following day and immediately rented a car. Arriving 15 minutes ahead of his appointment at the Sovereignty and Treaty Protection Office, he stood in the parking lot and admired the natural beauty of the surrounding woodlands. At the appointed time, he was shown into the office of the head of the tribal council, Morgan Ballou. The man stood and offered his hand. As they shook, he said, It is an honor to meet you, Professor Grayson. I did an internet search on you before our appointment. You have quite the academic resume. I am flattered you took the time to do so, Mr. Ballou. The man gestured toward a chair in front of his desk. Please, make yourself comfortable. As they sat, Baloo clasped his hands together and looked Grayson in the eye. I will not tell you where they are. I beg your pardon? I know why you are here, and I will not expose their location. The female is with child, and it will be born as a sovereign citizen of this tribal nation. Grayson raised an eyebrow. Mr. Baloo, I do not believe you understand who or what you are protecting. We understand perfectly who we offered shelter to, Professor. Within our culture, all creatures of the earth are sacred. The two individuals we now protect may be more so than others. The conversation continued for another hour, with Morgan Baloo emphasizing the tribe's position numerous times. When Baloo escorted Grayson out of the office, he kept the door open. He stopped, folded his arms, and tilted his head slightly. Professor, we can appreciate your concern for our new guests, but do not attempt to find them. We are an ancient tribe with ancient beliefs and traditions. We will protect the child and its parents at all costs. His glare sent shivers up the professor's spine. By the time Grayson returned to his rental car, night had fallen. A stiff wind blew hard out of the northwest. Moisture-laden clouds played hide-and-seek across the face of a full moon. The scene reminded him of a night nearly a year ago. A similar howl in the wind gusting through the trees reached his ears. It was the night he ran through the force of Galliano.
tales for dark nights.